After the community's reaction to our first lore compilation, we wanted to make sure you didn't have to wait until the end of year two to enjoy more long-form Elden lore content. From now on, we're going to create new lore compilations, featuring specific groups of characters across the lands between. Now that we've published our video on the Drake Knights, we've covered every faction of knights in the lands between, and we wanted to put them all together so you don't have to dig through our playlist for a comprehensive lore dive. We considered having this compilation simply cover the different knights devoted to the demigods, such as the Red Mains and the Clean Rots, but ultimately, we feel it makes more sense to include every knight faction in the game, so you'll also see those that fall outside of these regular variations, such as the Bloodhound Knights, the Mausoleum Knights, and more. This compilation will also not be in the order that these videos were released, so don't be surprised if quality dips between videos. Chapters will be included as well, so you can feel free to skip around if you don't want to revisit anything you've already watched in our previous Elden Ring Lore to Study and Relax to video. With all of that said, thank you for helping this series reach the point where we can even make this long-form content. Let's begin. Godric the Grafted is known to be the weakest of the demigods. Not only is his royal blood considered diluted, but time and again he has shown cowardice in the face of adversity and took from others through grafting in an attempt to make himself stronger. While he considered himself the rightful ruler of the lands between, due to his parentage leading back to Godwin the Golden, it's clear that he's barely a demigod at all, perhaps only having a rune because it was passed down to him over time. That said, Godric himself is not the topic of this video. Instead, we will be talking about someone deeply tied to the grafted demigod. This formidable warrior is known throughout the Elden Ring community as one of the strongest, most fearsome encounters we will ever face. He has slaughtered countless tarnished, his power knows no bounds, and he attacks us when we are at our absolute weakest. Today, we will be thoroughly exploring the legend himself, the soldier of God, Rick. Wait, no, that's a typo. Okay, we're going to be talking about the soldiers of Godric. Okay, yeah, that's a lot less interesting. Whatever, we've covered all the other knights, so yeah, we're doing this. Grab a comfy seat and let's get to it. In order to understand the tragedy of these disgraced knights, we must first look to their armor. The Godric Knight armor tells us, its left breast is emblazoned with a two-headed war axe, an emblem of the golden lineage. The knights surely boasted of their strength in days long gone. So by the wording of this description, we can assume that the members of Godric's forces no longer consider themselves powerful in terms of their standing in the lands between. The tree and beast surcoat worn by Godric soldiers also drives this point home. Armor worn by soldiers loyal to Godric the Grafted. The surcoat depicts the distant Erd tree and the beast region, an emblem of the golden lineage. Both are symbols of glory now past. Godric soldiers may have once been formidable, but their glory days are long behind them, and their own master is directly responsible for their shame. According to Kenneth Height, there were multiple instances of Godric acting in cowardice. First, we know he was part of an attack on Landell. It's hard to say exactly which battle this was, but if we assume he fought alongside Godfrey the Grafted, then ancient Dragon Knight Kristoff's ashes tell us it was the first siege of Landell. After he saw the battle going poorly, instead of fighting alongside his men, he stole the Mimic's Veil from the royal capital and used it to hide among the women fleeing. This allowed him to escape with his life and his great rune, while Godfrey was captured and his men were slaughtered while retreating. The Godric soldier ashes even tell us, the soldiers who serve Godric the Grafted are what remains of the army that fled the royal capital of the Erd Tree. From here, he then went on to hide from Erdan behind the walls of Stormvale Castle and insult Melania, leading to a confrontation with her that led to him pleading for his life bringing even further shame to the memory of Godwin the Golden and his lineage. 
At this point, it's probably becoming clear why these knights and soldiers would no longer brag about their strength. In fact, they likely continue to serve Godric only because of his bloodline. The soldiers and knights of Godric are a curious case when it comes to armies in the lands between. They can be found in various areas of Limgrave, but not a single one is found within Stormvale Castle, where Godric the Grafton has taken up residence. When we explore the castle, we're mostly met with exiled soldiers and banished knights, along with emaciated commoners, a troll, rotten strays, a lion guard, an omen, and a testament to the horrors of Godric's ancient practice, a grafted scion. Many believe that the reason these are the enemies we find protecting the castle is that Godric recruited the strongest cell sorts and creatures he could find. After all, Godric was obsessed with strength, as we can clearly see from his taking strength from others through the art of grafting. This implies that not only do Godric's original forces live with the disgrace of serving a cowardly lord, but what remained of them were appointed away from the castle, no longer considered strong enough by their master to defend him. They couldn't prove their superiority to the forces of Landell, so their fickle lord tossed them aside, relegating them to nothing more than mere foot soldiers meant to walk his lands and defend anything he considered his. Clearly, when it came to masters, the Knights of Godric got the short end of the stick in the lands between, and they know it. Aside from the tree and beast Serco telling us that their glory days are long past, another item we can take from them, along with one of their ashes of war, implies that Stormville Castle is not their original home, and they may long for a way back to their former glory. There is a mounted Godric knight on a cliff southwest over the deathbed catacombs, whom upon death drops the ash of war, Golden Vow. This skill is passed down from antiquity among the knights of the royal capital. Raise armament aloft and pledge to honor the Erdtree in battle, granting self and nearby allies increased attack power and defense. Why would a knight of Godric be able to use this skill Perhaps in the days before the Shattering, these knights served another lord, Godwin the Golden. We know that Godwin lived within the royal capital, so naturally his knights would have been stationed alongside him. In their time, they may have even been Landell knights. The gilded great shield they drop tells us, the red tinge in the gold coat mirrors the primordial matter that became the Erdtree, the color of homeward yearning. These knights likely followed Godric the Grafted out of Landell during the Shattering due to their allegiance to their original lord. As his descendant, they felt loyalty to Godric first and foremost. And unfortunately, this is how their loyalty was rewarded. They fought an unwinnable battle against the city they once called home, and bore the disgrace of both their own defeat and the cowardice of their lord, only to make it back to his castle and be told they were no longer worthy to defend its walls. It's no wonder these knights long for the days where they could boast their strength and want nothing more than to return to their home, the capital city, and once again bathe in the golden rays of the Erd Tree. In fact, we even find these soldiers and knights defending the Tower of Return, which provides a way back to the capital city, but their shame likely keeps them from using it themselves. The soldiers and knights of Godric easily have the worst lot of any army in the lands between. Even if you consider the clean rot knights, who are perpetually rotting, I would argue Godric's forces are still worse off, as the clean rots at least carry the title of strongest knights in the lands between, and feel a true sense of loyalty to Melania. For Godric's knights, their glory days are well behind them, and they likely feel no love or loyalty for Godric himself, just a sorrowful sense of duty to defend the once great bloodline of Godwin the Golden, no matter how badly Godric himself tarnishes the name. They are truly forsaken by their lord, their home, and grace itself, but still they hold the line, even if they can never recapture the dignity they lost in their service to the poorest excuse for a demigod we encounter. Thank you for joining us for our dissection of Godric's Knights. This wraps up all of the standard knights found in the Lands Between, 
but we still plan on diving into the Karian Knights as well. There are also the Drake Knights, but we believe our video on Yora and Eleonora already hit on all of the information currently known about them, so we really are rounding out every knight faction in the lands between. Why do you think Godric's armies are not allowed within Castle Stormvale? Do you believe they were once soldiers of Landell? How many times did you die to the immortal soldier of God, Rick? Let us know your thoughts and stories in the comments. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell if you haven't already. YouTube isn't pushing Elden Ring content at the moment, so anything you can do to boost the channel is truly appreciated. We look forward to seeing you again for more Elden Lore. We've had a few videos diving into the various knight factions in the lands between. Some served individual lords, some were banished and became mercenaries, others live in death and defend the mausoleums of long dead demigods. One faction of knights stands out amongst the others for less than scrupulous reasons. The Knights of the Cuckoo are the defenders of Rhea Lucaria Academy, but they hold no love for those they defend. These knights are little more than hired hands, contracted for a job, and given knighthood regardless of whether or not they are truly deserving of the title. Today we're going to take a look at the history of these knights and delve into their true purpose, not the defense of the academy, but as the brute strength needed to challenge its leadership. In order to understand the history of the Cuckoos, we first need to understand a little bit about the history of the Academy of Rhea Lucaria. It's easy to assume that the Karian royal family has always been the leadership of the academy, but this is not true. The spell, Rinala's Full Moon, tells us, Queen Rinala encountered this enchanting moon when she was young, and later, it would bewitch the academy. And the remembrance of the Full Moon Queen says, In her youth, Rinala was a prominent champion who charmed the academy with her lunar magic, becoming its master. She also led the Glintstone Knights and established the House of Caria as royalty. So not only was Rinala made the master of the academy due to her mastery of moon sorcery, but the Carian royal family was not even royalty before she was put in charge. At some point there seems to have been a falling out between the academy and Rinala. While the sorcerers of the academy wanted to continue studying the stars, Rinala wanted to follow the guidance of the moon. The scholars tolerated this notion as she was their leader, but in secret, they planned for the moment when they could turn the tide and replace the Karian royal family at the top of the totem pole. It was to this end we believe the Knights of the Cuckoo were founded. There is a form of parasitic cuckoo, which is a type of bird that lays its eggs in another bird's nest in order to have it hatched and made strong by the birds whose nest it invaded. It's no surprise that this is the symbol the Academy gave their knights. The Cuckoo Great Shield is a metal great shield painted with a peering cuckoo, carried by the enchanted knights sworn to the Academy. Boasting high magic damage negation, the shield is used to hunt down mages. Our enemy is none other than Karya itself. The shield confirms that the cuckoos were always intended to be the enemies of the Karian knights those who served the royal family. The sorcerers of the academy started their own faction of muscle under the nose of Queen Rinala, within her nest, with the intention of taking the academy from her. However, it's likely this did not go unnoticed. When we visit Karia Manor, we can see a graveyard just outside, and when we read the inscription, it tells us, This is the resting place of the contemptible cuckoos, lost in the siege of Karia. If we look at the Karian Knight's shield, we can see it excels when facing magic or holy attacks, and asks, just who were these knights prepared to fight? While they certainly weren't the only intended target, we believe the Cuckoos were one of those battles the Karians were ready for. The Rhea Lucaria Soldier Ashes summon a trio of spirits consisting of two disposable foot soldiers and their superior, and tells us that the soldiers of Rhea Lucaria were also known as the Cuckoos, 
they were given free reign by the academy to wage war as they pleased, and they were infamous for their rapacious ways. These knights were given faux sorceries and told they could pillage whatever lands they saw fit in the name of Rhea Lucaria Academy, an enticing offer to those who were likely nothing more than hired muscle before their ascent to knighthood. We believe this deal struck between the Academy and their knights was somewhat symbiotic in that the knights now had a title and the Academy now had protection and an army of their own. While it seems as though they never achieved their goal of putting an end to the royal family, they did see at least one victory on their front, trapping Bowles, the Carian knight, inside the Cuckoo's Everjail. Bowles was no ordinary Carian knight. He was a troll in the service of the royal family who could wield Carian magics. We know the Cuckoos never rose to the same strength as a Carian knight, so we have to assume they managed this feat with sheer numbers as opposed to brute strength. The Cuckoo's surcoat and armor add even more context to who the Cuckoo Knights truly were behind their service to the Academy. The surcoat depicts twin Cuckoos peering into a flourishing mass of glintstone. To a glintstone sorcerer, the body is a transient thing. The Cuckoo alone knows its insignificance, yet watches over it all the same. This description shows us how the Cuckoo Knights had little care for their benefactors. They saw them as insignificant but chose to watch over them due to the perks of being a knight, such as access to sorcery and free reign to do as they please. Meanwhile, the Cuckoo Knight armor tells us its left breast is emblazoned with a peering cuckoo, whence came their name. Perhaps the bird's shrewd gaze is an expression of their refusal to be mere servants of the Academy. So not only were these knights given free reign and access to magic, but it was still not enough. They wanted autonomy from the Academy the ability to use their name and status without having to answer to their benefactors. We believe this bad blood started with the attack of Caria Manor. After Lord Radagon left Renala, she was driven mad and became obsessed with the amber egg he left her. We know that at some point, the Academy locked her away within her study and took control for themselves. We also know that after the shattering, they sealed the gates of Rhea Lucaria Academy so that only those with glintstone keys could gain access. It's interesting to note that you cannot find a single cuckoo knight within the walls of the academy. They're all encountered outside, either protecting the barrier or wandering on their own. Perhaps after sealing Renala in her study and taking over the academy, the sorcerers of Rhea Lucaria ordered the cuckoos on the warpath to destroy the Karian royal family once and for all. Upon their defeat, the Cuckoos would likely have a bone to pick with the sorcerers who sent them into this losing battle. If this attack was made just after the Shattering, the timeline could align in such a way where the gates of the Academy were locked while the Cuckoos were away, which would explain their refusal to be servants of the Academy and put their own needs above their so-called duty. In the end, the Knights of the Cuckoo exist only in part to protect the Academy of Rhea Lucaria. Perhaps they do feel some sense of duty that keeps them defending the immediate area around the school, but every piece of lore we can find attached to these enemies makes it clear that they care more for their own interests than they ever did about truly acting as knights on behalf of the Academy. The Cuckoos are a destructive force, masquerading as symbols of nobility, but their actions, as well as the symbology of their very armor and surcoats, betrays their truly nefarious nature. These knights do not serve a master, they humor one until the wind blows in a more favorable direction. As long as they're supplied a steady, easily digested source of simple magic they can use of their own accord, they are placated. However, the academy must always watch their backs. Should their magical seals ever fall, it's possible the cuckoo's greed may extend within the walls of Rey Lucaria itself. Thanks again for joining us as we dissect the various enemies throughout Elden Ring. What do you think of the Knights of the Cuckoo? Do you agree with our theory of their origins and purpose? Was the grave marker outside of Karya Manor created in reverence or as a warning? In your opinion, which knight faction has the best Elden Drip? We look forward to reading your thoughts in the comments. Like, subscribe, and hit the bell so you always get notified when we put out new content. 
We look forward to seeing you again for more Elden Lore. You could consider knights a dime a dozen in the lands between. We can encounter Godric's knights, knights of the Cuckoo, Landell knights, Redmain knights, the list goes on. Every demigod essentially has their own form of knight aside from Moog, who lives in the shadows and thrives on secrecy. So this raises the question, does Reichard have his own knights? In his current form, you can consider the recusants his equivalent force. But what about before he set his plots into motion? What about the time when Reichard ruled over Mount Gelmir as a demigod of the Golden Order, before he committed the ultimate blasphemy and fed himself to the god-devouring serpent? As it turns out, before he founded the Recusants, before he built up his serpent army, Reichard did have knights under his employ, the Knights of Gelmir. These knights go almost completely unseen throughout Elden Ring, which raises the question, what happened to them? Why is it that their armor is only seen once on a particular NPC, and why can we never do battle with these knights ourselves? In today's Elden lore, we're going to explore the Knights of Gelmir, and take you through our theories on why we never encounter them on our journey to become Elden Lord. The only true description of the Gelmir Knights comes from their armor set. This armor can only be found within the Gelmir Hero's Grave, guarded by a Bloodhound Knight. Given that Bloodhound Knights are loyal to their masters, we can assume this Bloodhound was either placed here by Praetor Reichard, or was subservient to the Knight likely buried in the casket behind the corpse we loot the armor from. The Gelmir Knight Helm tells us it is the helm worn by knights once loyal to Praetor Reichard. Its crest of red feathers symbolizes Reichard's pedigree as Lord Radagon's son. And their armor tells us it is armor worn by knights once loyal to Praetor Reichard. It bears an emblem that none wear any longer, standing as it does for a lord that fell from loft ambition into gluttonous depravity. As the lord lost his dignity, so too did these knights lose their master. If we subscribe to the idea that the Bloodhound Knight watching this armor was once in service of the Gelmir Knight this corpse looted the armor from, it could paint a picture of a knight who earned a burial in the Gelmir Hero's Grave, and a grave robber, hoping to capitalize on the now disbanded Gelmir Knights. We learned one thing for sure from this armor. The Gelmir Knights, in some way, have disbanded, which is why we never come to find them in the Lands Between. The only member of the knights we can truly encounter is an apparition within Volcano Manor. This apparition will appear at random when visiting the Volcano Manor. He kneels on the ground just past the drawing room, muttering to himself, Someone please kill him. That horrendous serpent. Praetor Rikard. Should we speak with him, he says, you're tarnished, here to put the demigods to the sword. Then please, kill the great serpent, the one that devoured Praetor Reichard. I left the serpent slaying spear in the Lord's chamber, worthy tarnished. Brandish the spear and run him through. The Great Serpent. That unspeakable monstrosity. Pray to Rikard's ambitions, though blasphemous. Marked him a worthy sovereign, but they were reduced to gluttonous depravity once he gave himself to the Serpent. Whatever that thing is, it is no longer Praetor Reichard, 
Someone must kill him to spare him and his ambitions from further dishonor. It would seem this Gelmir Knight once tried to put Reichard's ambitions to rest himself, as his corpse can be found with the serpent slaying spear. This ghost is all that remains of the Gelmir Knights, and we have two different theories as to where they may have gone after they lost their master. Our first theory ties directly to the man we find in Volcano Manor. As this nameless Gelmir Knight explained, he saw the serpent devour Reichard, and he left behind the serpent slaying spear in order for someone to put his lord out of his misery. It seems unlikely that one man would come across this spear on his own, and the description of the serpent hunter backs up this line of thinking. Weapon that serves as both greatsword and spear, thought to have been used to hunt an immortal great serpent in the distant past, it manifests a long blade of light when facing such a creature. When their master's heroic aspirations degenerated into mere greed, his men searched for a weapon with which they might halt their lord. With that description in mind, it all but confirms the attack on Praetor Reichard where this knight lost his life was not a one-on-one -on -one battle. After seeing Reichard's ambitions reduced to gluttonous depravity, eating the strong and taking their strength for himself, the Gelmir knights felt a sense of duty to end the life of the serpent that murdered their lord, in an attempt to restore some dignity to Praetor Reichard and do away with the thing he had become. Of course, if this was the plan, we know how it ended. None survived and all were devoured, becoming one with the serpent and their lord, except for a single knight, the wielder of the serpent slaying spear and the ghost residing within the manor, begging any who would listen to finish the battle the Gelmir knight started and bring dignity back to Reichard through his death. Our second theory is based on an odd detail found on the back of the Gelmir Knight's cloaks. Their cloaks harbor the same sigil that is found on the Distinguished Great Shield, a shield closely tied to Diallo's Hoslo. We know that the scions of House Hoslo used armor, helms, and weapons with close ties to their lineage. It would make sense that their shield too would be an heirloom of their family. With this in mind, it leads us to believe that the crest found on this shield of the Hoslo family ties their origins directly to the Gelmir Knights. Perhaps some of the Gelmir Knights that served prey to Reichard were actually tarnished, and once their people were banned from the lands between, they settled elsewhere and traded their armor for noble houses. The crest would follow along with them, someday becoming a symbol of House Hoslo, carried by Diallos when he made his return at the behest of Grace. Perhaps this is one of the reasons Diallos is so easily flattered into becoming a recusant and joining the Volcano Manor, and the same reason his brother Juno decided to reject their offer. Diallos, not knowing his family history and dreaming of victory in battle, was easily persuaded by Tanith that his place was among the servants of the lord his family originated from, while Juno understood what Reichard had deteriorated into. It's possible that both or neither of these theories are true. While lore does suggest that the Gelmir Knights stood against Praetor Reichard, it's possible they simply fell into obscurity, as they had no lord to follow. However, we believe the clues left behind in the form of the Nameless Apparition, his spear, and the Distinguished Great Shield are intentional breadcrumbs left to help us paint a picture of what may have happened to Praetor Reichard's original guard. One thing is for certain, should we defeat Reichard, the last Gelmir Knight in the Lands Between can finally be at rest, as his spirit will vanish from the Volcano Manor, and the only thing left behind will be a simple reward for our efforts, the My Thanks gesture, a token to the Tarnished who helped him fulfill his purpose. Thank you for joining us on this exploration of the Gelmir Knights. These particular knights have very little true lore that can be uncovered by simply gathering items, and it was fun trying to determine what their story could have been through the context clues of obscure symbols. What do you think happened to the Gelmir Knights? Were they all devoured in their desperate attack against the god-devouring serpent? Or did some splinter off to create houses of their own? Also, who was the nameless apparition in Volcano Manor? And why wasn't his soul devoured like the rest? 
Let us know your thoughts in the comments, we can't wait to read them. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell so you never miss out on our lore and theories. We look forward to seeing you again for more Elden Lore. In examining the Knights of the Lands Between, we've come to understand the factions they served better than we ever have before. The Clean Rots were considered the strongest warriors devoted to a demigod, while the Red Mains were known for their fierceness and battle prowess. The Kukos were rapacious sellswords turned knight for coin, and the Mausoleum Knights served their long dead demigods from beyond the grave. Every knight faction has a background worth digging into, so we wanted to make sure every one of them got their due. With that said, we realized in our research that the Knights of Lanedell and the Knights of the Halic Tree seem to have less concrete background information than many of their counterparts. For this reason, we decided to present their stories together in one video, giving viewers a two-for-one deal on their lore, and dissecting the Knights of both Honeyed Gold and Unalloyed Gold. The Knights of Lanedell are the defenders of the Royal Capital, and their armor outlines their purpose as defenders of the Erd Tree. The Landell Knight Helm tells us it is the helm worn by knights sworn to defend the royal capital of Landell. The golden canopy represents the honor of standing among the tree's defenders. Each faction of knight shares the same kind of helmet, but they're adorned with a symbol specific to their faction. For the Landell Knights, this takes the form of a canopy representative of the earth tree. Their role of defenders is further expounded upon by their armor and shield. The Landell Knight Armor tells us, its left breast is emblazoned with a symbol of Erdtree worship, said to have once been imbued with an incantation of protection. Interestingly, these symbols were once imbued with protection, suggesting that they no longer are, likely due to Marika's imprisonment within the Erdtree. Lastly, we have the Golden Great Shield, an oval great shield made of gold, carried by knights who protect the royal capital of Landell. Knights of Landell are reputed for their sturdiness, exemplified by the shield's exceptional guard capacity. Again, we're told of these knights' great prowess as defenders, fighting their battles from behind a shield and acting as a bulwark between the city and those that would come to harm the Erd Tree. As far as their equipment is concerned, there's nothing special about these knights. They can wield the knight's greatsword, a partisan, or a great bow. Standard equipment for knights in the lands between. Where we can dig a little deeper is with their use of lightning-based skills, denoting their prowess with dragon cult incantations. We know the Landell Knights can be fought in the city and in certain areas of the Altus Plateau, but it's likely your first encounter with their ranks was well before riding the Grand Lift of Dectus. For some reason, a Landell Knight defends the road to the artist's shack in Liernia of the Lakes, and upon defeating him, you are rewarded with the dragon cult prayer book. This book allows you to learn three different Dragon Cult incantations, Electrify Armament, Honed Bolt, and Lightning Spear, all of which tell us, Long ago, Godwin the Golden defeated the ancient dragon Fortisax and befriended his fallen foe, an event that gave rise to the ancient Dragon Cult in the capital. So while these knights are lauded for their defensive abilities, it seems many, if not all of them, are also capable of utilizing the lightning of the dragons. Further proof of this can be found when defeating a specific knight in Landell who drops the Gravelstone Seal, which is a sacred seal made from Gravelstone thought to be an ancient dragon scale, enhances dragon cult incantations of the royal capital. The worship of the ancient dragons does not conflict with belief in the Erd Tree. After all, this seal and lightning itself are both imbued with gold. This all but confirms that the Knights of Landell followed in Godwin's footsteps, and upon making peace with Fortisax, they too learned to utilize golden lightning to help in their defense of the Erdtree capital. If we explore the sainted hero's grave, we can learn the story of the man buried there, the most decorated Landell knight in the lands between, ancient dragon knight Kristoff. Upon defeating the boss of the area, 
we are presented with Kristoff's ashes. Legendary ashen remains, used to summon the spirit of Kristoff, the ancient dragon knight. Spirit of Kristoff, an honorable knight of Landell, who was also a devout worshipper of the ancient dragons. His skills strike down foes with thunderbolts, the dragon's weapon of choice. After the first defense of Landell, Kristoff earned the hero's honor of Erdtree burial for the feat of capturing Godfroy the Grafted. Kristoff was respected by the Golden Order, and not only was he given an Erdtree burial, allowing him to be summoned to Spirit Ash, but had his grave defended by a myriad of powerful warriors, including a Black Knife assassin, a Grave Warden duelist, and an ancient hero of Zamor. We know surprisingly little about Godfrey the Grafted, but it's safe to say he was a descendant of Godwin the Golden, and given his presence at the first defense of Landell, he either led his own forces against the capital city, or he fought on the side of Radon during his siege. Because so little is known about Godfrey specifically, and the only attacks in the capital city we have any information on are those of the dragons and General Radon, we assume that Radon's march against the capital was the first defense of Landell. During this battle, ancient dragon knight Kristoff, a lowly knight of Landell and member of the dragon cult, managed to capture a traitorous demigod, making him a legend in the lands between. While we think it's fair to say that Godfrey likely had already passed down his great rune to his next descendant before the battle, it's still an incredible feat for anyone other than another demigod or a tarnished to defeat a demigod in combat, even one that was reduced to grafting to make themselves stronger. Ancient Dragon Knight Kristoff is a perfect example of the power hidden behind these unassuming knights. With a strong defense and the power of the dragons on their side, the Knights of Landell are a force to be reckoned with. Next, we wanted to discuss the other Knights of Gold that can be found in the Lands Between, the Halic Tree Knights. Unlike the Knights of Landell, their gold is unalloyed, the gold created by Mikola himself. While there wasn't much in the way of lore behind the Knights of Landell, there's even less when we look at the Knights of the Halic Tree. Their armor tells us it is armor worn by knights sworn to the Halic Tree. Its left breast is emblazoned with the crest of the Halic Tree. Though watered with Mikola's own blood since it was a sapling, the Halic Tree ultimately failed to grow into an Erd Tree. We think it's safe to assume that these knights once worked under the employ of Mikola before he abandoned the Golden Order, and unlike others who flocked to the Halic Tree as a means of safety for themselves or others, such as Loretta, the Halic Tree soldiers and knights were always dedicated to their lord. The Halic Tree soldier ashes shed light on how devoted these followers truly were. Spirits of common soldiers who carry the sacred light. When weakened, they explode to deliver a last ditch attack. This was the bitter revelation discovered by the desperate soldiers who awaited the return of their lord to the rotted Halic Tree. May the flash of our deaths guide Mikola's return. These soldiers willingly gave their lives in defense of the Halic Tree, and we have to assume the knights would do the same. The helms worn by the knights of the Halic Tree are also unique, as their adornment doesn't rise above their heads, like the red hair of the red manes or the canopies of the Landell knights. The Halic Tree Knight Helm is a helm worn by knights sworn to the Halic Tree, graced by a crown of unalloyed gold. Instead of a garish display of their loyalty to their faction, these knights simply wear unalloyed gold upon their heads, the most distinctive symbol of their master, Mikola. They also carry the Halic Tree Crest Shield, which features imagery depicting what the Halic Tree was meant to be. Metal Great Shield depicting the Halic Tree with unalloyed gold, carried by knights who have vowed to serve Mikola's Halic Tree, possesses high holy damage negation. Yet now, with the Halic Tree misshapen, this wondrous rendition is a fleeting fantasy. Everything about these knights comes across as tragic. Their master is gone, their tree is dying, but still they stand, side by side with clean rot knights, defending what is left of Mikola's dream, on the off chance that someday their master will return, and their watch over the Halic Tree will not have been for naught. 
we think it's worth mentioning. There is also a weapon that we believe ties directly to these knights, even though it's not wielded by any of their order. The Mikulin Knight's sword can be found atop a bell tower in Elphael, Brace of the Halig Tree. It is a sword forged by servants of Mikula of the Halig Tree, with a design modeled after those carried by Carian knights. Instead of glintstone, however, amber from the Halig Tree is embedded in the blade. A sumptuous piece, yet it has never been offered to any knight. An ill-starred sword with no master. We believe that due to its name and location, that should Mikula have brought his dream to fruition and grown his Halig Tree to its full potential, this sword would have been bestowed upon the leader of the Halig Tree Knights. It's possible this weapon could have been meant for Loretta, but we aren't sure when she arrived at the Halig Tree, before or after Mikula's absence. So it's just as likely that the sword was simply intended for whoever Mikula deemed worthy of leading his forces. The skill attached to this sword, Sacred Blade, even allows the user to fire golden blades with each swing, reminiscent of the Rings of Light Mikula granted to his father Radagon and the Clean Rot Knights, a fitting attack for any who would lead the Halig Tree Knights. All things considered, the Knights of Landell and the Halig Tree Knights actually serve the exact same purpose. Each order is meant to defend their sacred tree from harm, and both do so with the golden abilities handed down to them by their lords. Dragon incantations from the heir to Landell, Godwin the Golden, and the holy essence of the sacred order from the creator of the Halic Tree, the Empyrean Mikula. While they may serve different lords, they both act as walls against those who would invade their cities and threaten the safety of their trees. While the Halic Tree may never grow to its full splendor, the Halic Tree Knights stand firm in their dedication to Mikula. And while the world will stay stagnant without a new Elden Lord, the Knights of Landell will not stand aside as we ransack our way to the base of the tree. Both factions have their pride, and neither are willing to allow our tarnish to reach the base of their tree without proving ourselves more powerful than them. Thank you for joining us for this exploration of the Golden Knights of the Lands Between. What are your thoughts on the Landell Knights or the Knights of the Halig Tree? Which do you believe is more powerful? Who was Godfrey the Grafted, and should we try to piece together their story? Who was the Mikulin Knight's sword intended for? Do you think we'll get more background on the Halo Tree Knights in the upcoming DLC? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. Like, subscribe, and hit the bell so you never miss out on any of our lore dives. Thank you for being a member of this community. We can't wait to see you again for more. Elden Lore. Many of the enemies we encounter in the Lands Between can come across as palette swaps. The various knights we fight have similar weapons and almost identical armor, aside from the colors indicating which faction they belong to. While each of these enemy types has their own lore and backgrounds, you're likely to start riding past and ignoring them after spending some time in Elden Ring's world. However, even among this more monotonous enemy type, we can find one variant that raises some eyebrows. The Mausoleum Knights sport very similar armor to the other knights we find, however there are some key differences, such as the wings protruding from their back, and the fact that they are ghostly and headless. So who are the Mausoleum Knights? Why are they seen so infrequently through the lands between? And why don't they have heads? Today we're going to find out. In order to understand the Mausoleum Knights, we first need to learn more about the wandering mausoleums. These large structures can be brought down to earth by our tarnished if we scrape off what looks like ghosts or soul-shaped curse marks from their feet. Upon doing this we can enter the mausoleum and use the grave inside to create a new remembrance of a boss we've already defeated. This tells us what they can do from a gameplay perspective, but from a lore perspective these buildings are a little more complicated. The ghost at the Church of Pilgrimage says the mausoleum prowls cradling the soulless demigod. O oh, Mariga, Queen Eternal, he is your unwanted child. So who is the unwanted child? Each mausoleum houses a casket, so do they each contain an unwanted child? 
When we rest at the capital outskirts, Melina tells us spoken echoes of Queen Marika linger here and asks if she should share them with us. In Marika's own words, hear me, demigods, my children beloved, make of thyselves that which ye desire, be it a lord, be it a god, but should ye fail to become aught at all, ye will be forsaken, amounting only to sacrifices. With these two pieces of dialogue, we can understand a few things. First, Marika has children aside from the demigods we fight in-game that may have carried great runes. Second, she sees any of her children who do not make something of themselves as sacrifices. And third, the demigods housed inside these mausoleums are soulless, much like Godwin the Golden. We think it's safe to assume that any demigod who was given a true death has a walking mausoleum associated with them, so we know at least seven demigods were considered soulless, given true deaths, and had their bodies entombed. It's possible the mausoleum in the deep root depths may actually be for Godwin the Golden, but we also know he was given an Erdtree burial, laid at the foot of the Erdtree. This is also a bit confusing because of the two places we can find Godwin's corpse, but it's possible that since he had to become soulless, a mausoleum would have been created in his honor. So when we talk about the Mausoleum Knights, we're talking about knights who have dedicated themselves to defending the corpses of their old masters, now housed within mausoleums that wander the lands between. The bulk of what we can learn about these enemies comes from their armor descriptions. The Mausoleum Knight armor set tells us it is armor worn by headless knights who endlessly guard the wandering mausoleum. The wing-shaped ornaments on its back evoke the death bird. A self-inflicted curse that ties the spirits of these knights to the land, having willingly beheaded themselves so that they may serve their masters in death. So these knights, in a kind of ritual, self-afflicted curse, cut off their own heads in order to make themselves deathless, and able to defend their mausoleums for all eternity. Interestingly, they carry very bland weaponry, such as the knight's greatsword, partisan, and great bow but their shield can give us a little more information on them. The Eclipse Great Shield is described as a metal great shield painted with the sun in Eclipse, carried by the headless mausoleum knights. The Eclipsed Sun, drained of color, is the protective star of the soulless demigods. It aids the mausoleum knights by keeping destined death at bay. This calls back to something we discussed in our Commander Nail video, the ghost of Castle Saul says, Lord Mikola, forgive me. The sun has not been swallowed. Our prayers were lacking. Your comrade remained soulless, which we believe was directed at Godwin the Golden remaining soulless. It seems there's a clear thread between eclipses and staving off destined death, and the symbol helps to keep these beheaded knights in the world of the living, defending their masters. We're able to find the ashes of one of these mausoleum knights in the Tomb Sword Catacombs. Lutel the Headless is described as the spirit of a headless knight who leads the mausoleum soldiers, wields a lance and robed in death, and hurls spectral lances at foes. Lutel sacrificed her life so that in death she could continue to protect a soulless demigod until their revival, earning her the hero's honor of Erdtree Burial. While these soulless demigods seem to be failures in the eyes of Marika, we think it's possible that the particular demigod Lutel was intended to defend may have been Godwin. After all, none of these other gods, to our knowledge, were given the honor of her tree burial, so it would make sense for Lutel to be buried alongside Godwin. This does raise another question. How was Lutel turned to spirit ash if her curse kept her undead? And second, why are her ashes found so far from the Erd Tree? What does our community think? While these enemies are typically found near walking mausoleums, there's one that can be found far from these structures. It guards the entrance to the Black Knife Catacombs, which is incredibly curious. Why would a mausoleum knight be stationed outside of the headquarters of the Black Knives? Perhaps this particular knight is looking to avenge their fallen master, Godwin the Golden by hunting down the leftover Black Knives. Or maybe they're being called by the Black Knife Print, the mark that had the power to slay Godwin, the last thing to make contact with his soul before it was taken from his body. 
These enemies may seem straightforward, but the implications of their dedication to soulless gods contained within the walking mausoleums opens up a lot of questions about the lands between. What was the world like before the Shattering? How many children did Merica have before Godfrey? And how were they made soulless? Were their souls fed to the Erd Tree? Is that why these soldiers await their revival? Who knows what the answers may be, but clearly we don't have enough information in game to be sure. Thank you for joining us for this dive into the Mausoleum Knights. While it seems like we may have hit a dead end when looking at the lore surrounding them, who knows? Perhaps future DLC could deal with the soulless demigods, and how exactly they became that way. Leave a comment letting us know your favorite knight enemy in the game. Like, subscribe, and hit the bell so you never miss out on our theories and speculation. We look forward to seeing you again for more Elden Lore. Last week, we explored the history of the Clean Rot Knights and found that in the Battle of the Aeonia, they were considered the victors against Radon's forces. While their victory in this battle is impressive, it's even more so when you consider the sheer strength they were up against. We speak not only of Radon himself, but of his elite soldiers and knights, the Red Manes. Among the Knights of the Lands Between, Radons were unique in that they held incredible strength and dedication to their lord. The Red Manes were said to hold no weakness, and until their confrontation with the Clean Rot Knights, they were likely considered the strongest in the lands. Today we're going to dig a little deeper and learn what we can about the Red Manes and the reputation they cultivated as Radon's elite soldiers. As you may have expected, the Red Manes derive their name from Radon's red hair. The Red Main Knight Helm is described as a helm worn by knights who fought by General Radon's side. The red plume is a symbol of Radon's pedigree as Lord Radagon's son, the mane of the proud red lion, and the red mane surcoat depicts a red maned lion raising a sword in the image of Radon. Thus they were red manes, and all proved they were worthy of the name. While the exact criteria for becoming a red mane are unknown, it is likely that there was more to it than simply pledging fealty to Radon. These soldiers had to prove they were worthy, and if we understand Radon, it's most likely that this was done on the battlefield. Interestingly, neither the Red Main soldiers nor knights carry unique weapons. The soldiers all have the same swords, and the knights use the same spears and swords as other knights found in the lands between. One thing that does differentiate them from, say, Godric's knights, or the Kukos, is their use of the Great Bow. This weapon is an enormous Great Bow larger than any man, and cannot be drawn with any ordinary level of strength. This shows us how these knights possessed incredible physical prowess, as they are able to not only wield these weapons, but also attach gravity magic to them as well. Aside from this, the Red Mains also have access to the Flame of the Red Mains Ash of War, a skill of the Red Mains who fought alongside General Radon, produce a powerful burst of flames in a wide frontward arc. This is one example of their prowess with fire, which they likely developed after the fall of Kaled. By looking at the Red Main Knight armor, we can see the fate they suffered after their defeat at the hands of the Clean Rot Knights. Armor worn by knights who fought by General Radon's side. When they were driven to defeat by Melania's Scarlet Rot, the Red Main Knights burned the crest on the left breast of their armor to indicate their resolve. Alas, dear home, I shan't see you again, for our duty is to remain here, a bulwark against the Blight. You might think that this plan to act as a bulwark against the Blight came from Jaren, Radon's guest general, but it seems as though after the defeat of their lord, the Red Main Knights took it upon themselves to be the wall between Kaled and the rest of the lands between. They utilized fire and even developed their very own type of fire pot in order to keep the Scarlet Rot from spreading anywhere else. They likely saw this as continuing their Lord's will as he stood against the Rot himself. In fighting to keep the land outside of Kaled safe, it was as if they were still fighting for Radon. 
These knights cannot be found anywhere outside of Kaled, likely due to their pledge to keep the rot from spreading. We can only encounter them in a few areas, such as a small camp near the smoldering wall site of Grace, inside Fort Gale, and in Castle Redmayne itself. And by both the state of Kaled and their dwindling numbers, it's fair to say that they're losing their ongoing battle against the rot. Even so, they press onward, defending their territories, and leading the Red Main soldiers in the controlled burning of areas of the land that have become too overgrown with infection. In fact, it seems as though Fort Gale itself may be the last line of defense between Caleb's spreading rot and Limgrave, and it does not appear to be going very well at all. When we visit the War Dead Catacombs, we can see what has become of the Red Main soldiers and knights who fell in the Battle of the Aeonia. Many were likely put to rest improperly due to the sheer number of dead, because we can find their spirits locked in an eternal battle with both the clean rot knights and whoever is foolish enough to set foot in their resting place. We believe they were put to rest improperly because the rot has reached this place as well. Below the main hall of the catacombs is a deeper floor with fetid rot pulled on the ground. Whoever was thrown in here likely had their remains rot away to nothing, and their spirits would have no way of returning to the earth tree, hence their presence doing battle above. Interestingly, there are a few who have escaped this terrible fate and have been laid to rest in a different way, being turned into spirit ashes. First, we can find the red main soldier ashes within a chest defended by a number of spirits. When using these ashes, you summon two soldiers. Both spirits wield fiery weapons to perform powerful skills, such as their valor, and they will immediately attack after being summoned. General Radon's soldiers were all reputed to be masterful warriors, and it was popularly said that the Red Mains knew no weakness. For whatever reason, possibly to retain some trace of themselves, these two soldiers were turned to Spirit Ash before being laid in the catacombs. Second, after defeating an ulcerated tree spirit, we gain the spirit ashes of Red Main Knight Oa, spirit of a mighty knight versed in the use of a great bow, a valiant warrior who will attack immediately after being summoned. The longest serving member of the Red Main Knights, Oa studied techniques to manipulate gravity alongside Radon. May use a rain of gravitational arrows in response to a war cry, but only once. From a gameplay perspective, he's unique in that he will actually respond to our war cry with a gravity attack, and instead of following us through a dungeon, he will instead patrol the area we summon him in. But more interesting is that in life, he shared a personal relationship with Radon. Oa was likely the very first Red Main Knight, as we know Radon studied gravity magic in his youth, making Oa the only known childhood friend of Star Scourge Radon. Perhaps he didn't die in the Battle of the Aeonia at all, and this was his resting place, long before it was known as the War Dead Catacombs. The Red Mains are an interesting case. They have every right to leave their post after their defeat at the Battle of the Aeonia. Their lord is now a mindless monster. He's not the man they once served and charged into battle alongside. But instead of choosing to leave Caled for greener pastures, they used the strength earned during their service to Radon to keep the rest of the lands between safe from the fallout of their lord's clash with Melania. Unlike the treacherous Kukos or the Landell Knights who only care about their city, the Red Mains work to keep others safe. This is how they choose to honor Radon, by brandishing the lion's crest on their armor, surcoats, and shields, content to die a horrible death at the hands of the Rot if it means they can do their duty in slowing the spread, and giving the rest of the lands between more time before it inevitably comes for them. Thank you for listening to our dissection of the Red Mains. What do you think of the elite force behind Star Scourge Radon? Do you have a favorite night set from the various factions of the lands between? Let us know in the comments. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell so you don't miss out on our next deep dive into the many enemies we face throughout Elden Ring. 
We look forward to seeing you again for more Elden Lore. What does it take to be seen as a formidable force in a place like the Lands Between? When there are monsters the size of small homes roaming the lands and demigods vying for power, what strength then does an army truly have? When men like Radon and women like Melania could fell an entire army with one swing of their blades, how do you become known as a force to be reckoned with? By fighting as if you have no future, like every battle could be your last, by fighting like the clean rot knights. In today's Elden Lore, we're going to take a look at Melania's elite guard, the clean rot knights, where their loyalty lies, their place in the history of the lands between, and the story of the only named clean rot knight we can find in Elden Ring, Finlay. The clean rot knights are found in many places through the lands between, but where many of us likely had our first experience with them was in the fetid lands of Kaled, where they remained after the epic clash between Melania and Radon. In order to gain an understanding of who these knights were, we can look at their armor and equipment. Their armor tells us they were celebrated for their undefeated campaign in the Shattering. The clean rotten knights vowed to fight alongside Melania, despite the inevitable, if gradual, putrefaction of their flesh. Their acceptance of their fate made these battles fiercest of all. So right out of the gate, we have two important facts about these knights. One, that their campaign during the Shattering was seen as undefeated, which many Radon fans would likely argue against. And two, that these knights are all afflicted with a Scarlet Rot. To further solidify their victory over Radon's forces, we can actually look toward the Red Main Knight armor, which tells us, when they were driven to defeat by Melania's Scarlet Rot, the Red Main Knights burned the crest on the left breast of their armor to indicate their resolve. You can still argue that the battle between Melania and Radon was essentially a draw, with Melania falling into a deep slumber, and Radon losing any sense of humanity after being so thoroughly afflicted by the rot. But when it comes to the battle of their armies, it seems set in stone that the clean rot knights were considered the victors over the red mains. We can still see this fierce battle raging on if we visit the war dead catacombs in Kaelid. It seems as though the massive amounts of dead left in the wake of this war were not necessarily given a proper burial. Their spirits live on in these catacombs, endlessly at war with each other. You can see the ferocity of the clean rot knights on display in these catacombs, as not only are their spirits difficult enemies for our tarnish to fight, but they seem to take on multiple red mains at a time. A one-on-one -on -one battle between a clean rot knight and any of Radon's forces would certainly end in their defeat so they have to use numbers against their rotted foes in order to have even a chance at victory. The armor of the Clean Rot Knights talks about their campaign during the Shattering. While there isn't much information on the specifics behind each battle during this time, we know a few things. Firstly, these knights fought under Melania, who called herself the Blade of Mikola. So interestingly, in truth, they were fighting not only for their lady, but likely also to put Mikola on the throne as that was Melania's purpose, to see her brother rise to power. As to why they were participating in this great war to begin with, we don't have a clear answer. Mikola and Melania seem to want to create a new path to the lands between, which may not even require an Elden Lord. However, with the other demigods warring and taking runes for themselves in a bid for power, it's possible Melania took the clean rot knights to battle in order to snuff out the ambitions of her family and make room for her brother's ultimate rule. This would make sense, as we know she and her forces did battle with Godric, bringing his castle to its knees, but didn't kill him or take his great rune. Their campaign seems to have been more about paving the way for their future ruler than consolidating power on their own. We can see the tie between the Clean Rot Knights and Mikola in the items that they have the possibility of dropping upon defeat. The lesser clean rot knights actually have a slight chance of dropping both Mikola and Trina's lilies upon their death. If we look at the description of Trina's lilies, they tell us they are a symbol of faith in Saint Trina that dulls the senses, 
preventing agitation. Perhaps these lilies were given to each knight as an additional ward to keep them from feeling the effect of the rot during battle. If their senses are dull to the constant pain they must be in, that would help them to fight more fiercely. To us, this is further confirmation of the undeniable tie between Mikola and St. Trina. This is not all though. The halo scythe carried by some clean rot knights ties them to Mikola's power as well. War scythe of the clean rot knights who fought alongside Melania, Blade of Mikola. This was the weapon of commanders in Melania's army, and the half halo blade deals holy damage. The specific holy damage mentioned comes in the form of their unique Ash of War, Mikola's Ring of Light. This ability produces the very same rings of light that Mikola gifted to his father, Radagon, in the form of incantations. When looking at them in this light, it seems the ferocity of the clean rot knights comes not only from their connection to Melania's rot, but the power of Mikola as well. So we've established the strength of these knights and the source of their power, but the question still remains. How do they survive so long while afflicted by Scarlet Rot? Thankfully, this has a straightforward explanation. The Clean Rot Spear tells us it is the Spear of the Clean Rot Knights who fought alongside Melania, Blade of Mikola. The Winged Golden Blade deals holy damage. The Diminutive Shield is blessed with an incantation that wards off Rot. It would seem that this tiny shield attached to their spears actually keeps the effects of the Rot at bay at least slightly. With our established connection between Mikola and the knights, it would be safe to assume Mikola was the one to imbue the shields with this ward, especially since we know one of his ultimate goals was to cure Melania of her rot, and he had studied every possible way of making this a reality. The clean rot knights can be found in various areas of the land that have been affected by the scarlet rot, but one of the most important in our eyes is the shaded castle. This castle was once a place where the Golden Order would send those who broke the rule of law to be executed. While its reputation may have once been strong within the Order, the head of House Marais became obsessed with Melania and pledged himself only to her. This saw Rot take the land while Clean Rot Knights came to make camp in the castle. One of them can even be found protecting a prosthetic arm we can retrieve from Millicent. While the Moray family lost control of the castle after the failed execution of Elmer of the Briar, the bell-bearing hunter, it seems as though the knights still maintain their posts. Even though the castle has a new master, he doesn't seem interested in starting a feud with the most powerful knights in the land. This is the legacy of the Clean Rot Knights. They followed two of the current Empyreans into glorious battle, defeating every enemy that stood in their path, and while this speaks to their strength, there was one among them whose dedication to their lady and journey to deliver her home safely speaks to their valor. Clean Rot Knight Finlay is a shining example of the strength and dedication of these knights. When we find her ashes, we learn they are legendary ashen remains, and that Finlay was one of the few survivors of the Battle of the Aeonia, who in an unimaginable act of heroism carried the slumbering demigod Melania all the way back to the Halic Tree. She managed the feat alone, fending off all manner of foes along the way. We know the toll the Battle of the Aeonia took on not only Melania, but the land of Caled. The wasteland left in the battle's wake has created one of the most dangerous landscapes the Lands Between has to offer. With that in mind, it is impossible to imagine that not only did Finlay survive that battle, but she was able to carry Melania all the way back to the Hallow Tree by herself. But according to lore, this is exactly what happened. In order to understand the gravity of this achievement, it's important to consider just how far Caled is from the Hallow Tree. Finlay would have had to carry an unconscious Melania out of Caled, through Limgrave, then make her way all the way from Lyurne of the Lakes to the Altus Plateau, a land under the watchful eye of Morgoth the Omen King. We have to assume that in order to reach the consecrated snowfield, Finlay must have had to parlay with the forces of Lando, as there's no way through without entering the city. From there, she needed to brave the snowy terrain until reaching the portal to the Halic Tree, all with Melania in tow. 
After her arrival, Finlay was likely met by the residents of Mikola's home, who could help her get Melania to the inner chamber. This is a journey we ourselves make, but the circumstances are wholly different. We conquer the lands with the strength of Tarnished, able to gather great runes and turn runes into strength. Finlay was one knight carrying her god on her back, and through sheer force of will, she survived and brought Melania home. Regardless of your feelings on Melania, Finlay was clearly a hero to those who believed in the promise of Mikola and the Halig Tree. The Clean Rot Knights are a force to be reckoned with, and we hope you enjoyed our exploration of their story. What do you think of their reputation in the Lands Between? Was it earned? Or do you believe their association with Melania built them into something more than they actually were? Comment letting us know. Personally, I would love more detail on the journey of Finlay from Calic to the Halic Tree. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell if you enjoy our content. We look forward to seeing you again for more Elden Lore. Throughout our Elden Lore series, we've been exploring the various night factions of the Lands Between. From the Crucible to the Clean Rod, we've dug through the possible histories of all the night factions connected to the Golden Order. But what about the knights that fought against those who worship gold? The ones who prepared themselves for battle against the Golden Order, for the glory of their own royal family? These knights were small in number, but were known as an elite force across the Lands Between and consisted of humans, trolls, and even a dragon. Today we are exploring the most requested knight faction from our comments section, the Karian Knights, loyal servants of the Karian royal family. Who were they? How did one become a Karian Knight? What was their purpose? And why do they number so few by the time we've reached the lands between? Let's try to answer these questions together. As we said, the Karian Knights were once an elite force in the Lands Between, with their own weapon giving us insight into the size of their order. The Karian Knight's sword is a straight sword embedded with a blue glintstone, weapon of knights sworn to Karian royalty. These knight's swords could serve as catalysts, letting them wield sorcerous battle skills. Despite numbering fewer than 20, this power made them a match for even the champions of gold in battle. So fewer than 20 knights have ever sworn this oath to the Karian royal family and been accepted at this level. This may be due to the size of the royal family, as it only contained Renala, Radagon, Rikard, Radon, and Lunar Princess Rani. With a family of only five members to defend, it would make sense so few would reach this level. Each of these knights carried the Karian filigree crest, a talisman adorned with the royal crest, an honor said to have once been awarded to Karian knights, who served as direct retainers to the kingdom's princesses. Now there is only one princess, Rani, daughter of Ranala. Interestingly, this item seems to imply that Radagon and Ranala may have had more children than we know about as the Karian royal family was not considered royal until Rinala took over Raya Lucaria Academy, as we know from the remembrance of the Full Moon Queen. In her youth, Rinala was a prominent champion who charmed the academy with her lunar magic, becoming its master. She also led the Glintstone Knights and established the House of Karia as royalty. The perplexing statement about multiple princesses aside, the armor of the Karian Knights gives us a clue as to what happened to their order. The Karian Knight armor is described as armor of the enchanted knights that once served the Karian royal family. The enchanted knights anointed by the Lunar Queen were heroes of the highest honors, but fell into disarray with the decline of the royal family. The decline of the royal family is not properly outlined but it stands to reason that this coincided with the Shattering. 
The Karian Knight Shield tells us, The Karian Knight Shield is a teardrop-shaped shield embedded with blue glintstones, carried by knights who served the Karian royal family, excels when facing magic or holy attacks. Just who were these knights preparing to fight? We believe that after Radagon was called back to marry Marika, the Karian knights began preparing themselves to do battle with both the Academy and the Golden Order, seeing the writing on the wall regarding an inevitable betrayal. Radagon married Renala to broker peace between the two factions, and with that marriage dissolved, the only thing keeping the peace was the Golden Order's new familial ties to the Karians and their lord's children. They were right, of course, as after the Shattering, the Kuko Knights attacked Karia Manor, and the children of the Full Moon Queen went their separate ways in pursuit of their own goals, with Ronnie being the only member of the family to stay behind. At this time, the Order likely disbanded, save for a few dedicated souls. This included an unnamed troll found within Karia Manor, Bowles Karian Knight, who was captured by the Kukos, Moongrum Karian Knight, and most surprisingly, Glintstone Dragon Adula. It's surprising to learn that the Karian Knights counted trolls among their elite ranks. While we know that the Karians and the trolls shared a partnership, the Troll Knight's sword illuminates just how close this relationship was. Greatsword embedded with a blue glintstone, weapon of the trolls in service to the royal family of Karia, called into service when the queen invoked an oath they swore. The trolls are treated as true knights of Karia and fight arm in arm with their human comrades. So not only were the trolls allies of the royal family, but they were treated as true knights. The spell Great Blade Phalanx sheds more light on their relationship. One of the sorceries of the Karian royal family creates a defensive arch of larger magic glint blades overhead, which automatically attack nearby foes. Used by the enchanted troll knights, they were the comrades of a young Renala, bound by oath. Presumably, long before she demonstrated her prowess to Rhea Lucaria and became the master of the academy, Renala cultivated a relationship with the trolls, teaching them her Karian sorceries, and forging a bond that would one day grant these trolls a place as heroes of the highest honor. More troll knights can be found defending places of great importance to the Karian royal family, like the converted fringe tower, and a puppet of a troll knight can be found on the road to Rhea Lucaria, north of the Liernia Highway north site of Grace. There are three more headless troll knights defending the four belfries, but we're uncertain if these are related to the Karian knights, even though they do wield the same weapons. The only humanoid Karian knight we can encounter in the lands between is Moongrum. He stands outside the elevator to Queen Renala's library and defends the entrance with his life. It is through Moongrum that we see how Karian knights fought in their glory days. He wields the Karian Knight Sword and Shield, but will also switch to a Karian Glint Blade Staff. He casts Karian Piercer, one of the sorceries of the Karian Royal Family, conjures a magic greatsword to impale foes. This sorcery forms a counterpart to Karian Greatsword, highly lethal when used against single foes riding alone. You could assume that Moongrim stays here defending the way to Renala because he wants to continue protecting the Queen, even though she's lost herself completely to the Amber Egg. But when considering what we learned from the Karian filigreed crest, it seems much more likely he was actually posted here by Rani to protect what's left of the mother she admired so deeply. After all, we see Rani's other failsafe meant to protect her mother when we do battle with the conjured form of Renala in her prime. Last but not least, we have the final living Karian knight, Glintstone Dragon Adula. We understand if you think it's a stretch to consider this dragon a Karian knight. However, upon defeating her at the Cathedral of Manu Celeste, we obtain Adula's Moonblade. Sorcery of Adula the Glintstone Dragon conjures a cold magic greatsword, then delivers a sweeping blow that launches a blade-like projectile of frost. Adula, 
a devourer of sorcerers, was bested by Rani, and subsequently swore a knightly oath to her dark moon. Upon pledging an oath to Rani, Adula took on the role of a Karian royal knight, even going so far as to develop her own Karian sorcery, likely powered by the many sorcerers she devoured over the years. Adula fills this role well, as she is the last line of defense between any who attempt to stop Rani from completing her goal and slaying her two fingers. She is Rani's defender and knight, just as much as any other humanoid knight of Karia. There are others you could consider as Karian knights, and we want to address these characters. Clearly, Blythe is Rani's knight, but more importantly, he is her shadow, granting him a station above that of any regular knight. We believe the same can be said for Loretta, before she became a knight of the Halig Tree. She originally pledged herself to the Karian royal family, and her armor even says she was once a royal Karian knight but it seems like she may be the closest thing they had to a leader, just below the royal family itself. Loretta was always seen on horseback, and melded her magic to a war sickle, never a sword. Perhaps her departure from her station at the Karia Manor also played a role in the dissolution of the knights. These warriors, said to be able to match the champions of gold in battle, were known for their prowess with both sword and staff. They expertly wielded sorceries like Karian Phallix, Karian Retaliation, Lucidity, and Karian Greatsword, alongside the weapon skill Karian Grandeur, making them an incredibly elite fighting force. In the end, no matter how strong they may have been, their order was no match for the single-minded selfishness of the demigods. Had it not been for Radagon's betrayal of Renala, driving her obsession with the Amber Egg, and the machinations of her children, the Order of the Karian Knights would likely have survived to this day, still defending the pride of Karia. But sadly, this was not to be. Between the blasphemy of Rikard, Radon's push to take the Elden Throne, Renala's loss of self, Rani's plotting from the shadows, and possibly Loretta's absence, this noble order collapsed in on itself with only a few left behind to serve the Karian royal family, and prove the strength that once labeled them heroes of the highest order. What do you think of the Karian knights? If Rinala was never enchanted by the Amber Egg, do you think their order would live on to this day? Why do you think their order all but disbanded? Why is it that the Karian knight build was so popular in the early days of Elden Ring? Do you consider Adula a true Karian knight? Let us know your thoughts and theories in the comments. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell so you never miss out on any of our lore dives. We look forward to seeing you again for more Elden Lore. The Albanorix have always been an interesting topic of conversation for those in the Elden Ring lore community. While the most overt story of them we can learn is that of Latena and her journey to bring Philia the birthing droplet, this race of man-made people make appearances all throughout the lands between. There are the first generation Albanorix, whose men are frail and whose women wield bows and arrows on wolfback, and second generation Albanorix, who retain the use of their legs at the cost of their human appearance. While the humanoid Albanorix are confined to their hometown and Ordina liturgical town, they seem to somehow be tied to sorcery, as the men wield magic, and the Albanorix rise contains the graven mass talisman. This leads us to a question. What if an Albanorix was made outside of their hometowns? What if an Albanorix was raised, never knowing their true nature, and assumed they were just like the other people around them? What if they dedicated their life to serving a lord or lady, only to find that their legs grew weary and nothing seemed to help? Today we're going to discuss the royal knight Loretta and try to weave together the story of how she left the Karian royal family to pursue freedom for her people. 
Loretta was known as a royal knight and can first be encountered when we're making our way through the Caria Manor. While this version of Loretta is nothing more than an apparition, we can see she wields Carian magics. Various item descriptions help us understand why we face the spirit where we do. The Royal Knight armor tells us, Loretta was once a royal Carian knight, and her lapis lazuli blue cape is the emblem of the knightly pride that continues to guide her. The magic she wields in this battle is a deep blue, the color of Carian sorceries. One of these spells is known as Loretta's Great Bow, and when we learn it ourselves, we learn that the bow was Loretta's favorite weapon. Loretta's War Sickle is another weapon associated with the Royal Knight. The description tells us it is an intricately crafted silver war sickle wielded by Loretta, Knight of the Halig Tree, originally given for service as a personal guard to Carian royalty. The weapon's blue glintstone has been replaced with unalloyed gold. With this information in mind, we can craft an idea of Loretta's life before replacing her glintstone with gold. It seems likely that Loretta was raised within the walls of Kari Manor, as the magic she wields relates directly to the royal family. According to their armor, the royal knights served as the personal guard of the royal family. This would put them a step above your typical Karian knight in rank. It's tough to say with certainty which member of the royal family Loretta guarded, but through process of elimination, we assume it was Ronnie. If Loretta was in service to Renala, we'd have probably faced her apparition somewhere outside of Renala's study, and if she served Radon, she'd have been at our side during the Radon festival, trying to bring dignity back to her former master. Since she still defends the way between us and Ronnie's rise, we think it's safe to assume she was originally meant to be Ronnie's protector. However, what would possess Loretta to trade her glintstone for gold, and leave nothing but an imitation of herself to defend her lady? We believe the truth of her inescapable fate as an Albanoric became apparent to her once her legs started to fade. All the information we can learn about Loretta tells us about her close ties to the Albanoric people. Most of her armor tells us, Loretta, once a royal Carian knight, went on a journey in search of a haven for the Albanorics, and determined that the Halig Tree was their best chance for eventual salvation. The spell Loretta's Mastery is a modified version of her original Karian magic, and tells us it was developed by Loretta after her long, bloody journey to seek out a place where the Albanorics could live in peace. If her interest in saving the Albanorics is not enough to convince you that she herself was one of them, we also have the description of the Silver Mirror Shield. It is known as a Shield of Radiant Silver, festooned with amber and carried by Loretta, Knight of the Halig Tree. The shape is said to imitate that of a sacred drop of dew, which inspired the absurd rumor that Loretta herself was an Albanoric. While the shield treats the idea of Loretta being an Albanoric as nothing more than a rumor, when we take into account her interest in securing a future for these people, and the fact that we only ever see her on horseback, never using her legs, the rumor seems more and more likely. What if, once Loretta started to lose strength in her legs, she discovered that her life had been a lie? That she was an Albanoric, fated to fade away? Her lady Ronnie had decided to take a stance against the fingers, slaying her own flesh and keeping her soul bound to a doll, and in doing so, may have inadvertently relieved Loretta of her vow to protect her member of the royal family. This would have left Loretta free to pursue salvation for her people, but her love for the Karians who raised her into the noble knight she now was, led her to leave a facsimile of herself, to defend what was left of Ronnie the Witch. In her travels, trying to find a place where the Albanorks can live free of persecution, she found the Halig Tree. Mikola's pursuit of a world where the downtrodden would no longer be persecuted in the lands between, likely resonated with Loretta, and she became a knight of the Halig Tree, trading her glintstone for gold after leading her people through Ordina Liturgical Town and to Mikola's base of operations. Perhaps Loretta is the reason for the Albanark archers who defend the town. After all, Loretta's weapon of choice was a bow, and she's only ever seen on horseback. We believe she trained this elite squad of Albanark women to destroy incoming threats to their potential home, 
and ride wolves to make up for their frailties. When we finally face Loretta, Knight of the Halo Tree, in combat, she's an incredibly formidable foe. Her relentless attacks can easily get the best of you while you struggle to dodge your way through and close the gap. The full strength of this Albanoric Knight is on display, and it is fearsome. Loretta is not fighting for her own selfish reasons. She is motivated to bring about a world where Mikola can return, fully grown, to rule over the lands between and stop the persecution that forced her to hide the truth of what she was. Perhaps Mikola had the power to build a better world for the Albanorics, both her first and second generation brothers and sisters, and if he did, Loretta would be there to defend her new charge. After all, a knight never truly loses their sense of duty, even if they did find themselves forced to switch masters. Loretta is a fierce warrior and we wish there were more hard facts about her personal journey from bodyguard of the royal family to defender of Mikola's dream. While it's never outright stated that she is an Albanoric, we believe there's substantial evidence to show us that she truly was among their ranks, even if she didn't know it herself at first. Her dedication to helping her people, those who lived under the oppression of the Golden Order, solidifies her as one of the most admirable bosses we face in Elden Ring. If only we didn't have to defeat her to move on and face Melania. Thank you for joining us for our lore dive into Loretta, Royal Knight and Knight of the Halig Tree. Do you believe Loretta was truly an Albanoric? Was the Silver Tear Shield meant to hint at her true origins, or was it simply a rumor? Do you believe she traded her glintstone for gold in order to help others, or was she simply helping herself? No matter what your thoughts, please share them in the comments. Like, subscribe, and hit the bell if you want to be notified when we drop a new episode. If you're already a subscriber, why don't you double click that bell just to make sure you continue to get notified about the new videos from STG. We look forward to seeing you again for more Elden Lore. The Lands Between as we know it is a hostile world filled with horrific beasts, warring factions, and cosmic horrors. On top of those challenges, we're often met with deceitful characters, all attempting to use our power and knowledge to further their own interests. That said, the concept of true loyalty is rather rare in this land, save for the shadows of Empyreans. This is why the Bloodhound Knights are such a curious oddity. Who are they? Where did they come from? And why do they carry the title of Bloodhound? We hope to answer these questions, or at the very least provide our interpretations. Let's first glean what we can from their armor and weaponry. The Bloodhound Knight found at the Gelmir Hero's Grave in Mount Gelmir drops the entire Bloodhound set upon being defeated. The helm reads, Metal helm with a pointed beak, worn by the Bloodhound Knights. The Bloodhound Knights are trained as hunters and known to be unshakable trackers. Without the use of language, each knight chooses his own master. Once the decision has been made, the knight stays loyal for life. From this item alone, we start to paint a picture of what drives these knights to fight with such unending ferocity. It seems that each bloodhound knight we encounter in our journey is wholly devoted to a master of their choosing, displaying unshakable loyalty to their master's cause. The same bloodhound knight drops the bloodhound claws, Though this weapon gives little insight into the overall lore of the knights, we can learn much more simply by observing how they fight. Each battle with the Bloodhound Knights is sure to distress even the most powerful of Tarnished. Approaching on all fours, their beastly appearance and frightening speed rival the intensity of even the Crucible Knights. Through the power of the Bloodhound's step, these knights are capable of moving at such a high speed that they almost appear to be teleporting. Along with their unrivaled speed, they attack our Tarnished with the fury and bloodlust of the most ferocious beasts in the lands between. Due to the beastly nature display in combat, and their inability to communicate without the use of language, we believe that the Bloodhound Knights are far from human, and perhaps don't even originate from the lands between at all. 
Sometime prior to our arrival in the Lands Between, the floating city of Faramazula was struck by some kind of cosmic cataclysm. A fallen star shattered the city into fractured pieces which fell below to the Lands Between. Not only do we see the fallout of this event by observing the many pieces of the kingdom jutting from the hills of Limgrave, or the colossal knights that litter the lands, but by the displaced creatures that now live alongside the natural flora and fauna of the lands between. Within the Groveside Cave, we encounter a beastman of Faramazula, hailing from a doomed city in the sky. We don't believe it's much of a stretch to assume, based on their behavior, that the Bloodhound Knights also fell from the City of Beasts. Whether this is true or not, the hounds now wander the lands between, displaced from their home, searching for a master. The first Bloodhound Knight our Tarnished is most likely to encounter is Bloodhound Knight Darawil. Upon meeting Blythe for the first time, we're tasked with hunting Darawil, as he is nothing but a traitor and in need of a fitting end to his tale. We end up tracking Darawil to the forlorn hound Everjail in South Limgrave. For his traitorous actions, Darawil has been eternally imprisoned. When we summon Blythe to fight alongside us, he says, Darawil, rotting in a cell is no true justice. No, this is where it ends for you. The Bloodhound Knights are known for their unshaking loyalty, and yet, Darawil is imprisoned and then hunted for some kind of betrayal. It's purely speculation, but we believe that at some point, Darawil had pledged his loyalty to Snow Witch Rani, which would explain Blythe's desire to slay him for treason if he left her service. As for who or what caused him to betray this proposed union, we have a loose idea. It's possible that when Rani purposely destroyed her own body, Darawil considered his service to her to be complete, and so he searched for a new master. Perhaps Darawil, being a beastly hound, simply didn't recognize the scent of his original master now that she inhabited a doll. This betrayal of her service would certainly have Blythe on the hunt. Another Bloodhound Knight can be found at the Lakeside Crystal Cave in Liernia. Just after defeating him, we meet an Albinoric woman, Latena. She says, Foul tarnished, what do you want? I told the all-hearing brute that I possess no such medallion. If we have spoken with Albus in the village of Albinorix, he gives us the right half of the Halig Tree medallion to give to Latena. Based on her dialogue, it seems that this particular bloodhound was searching for the Halig Tree medallions. With the bloodhound knights being loyal servants to a single master, we're met with a question. Who would task this hound with retrieving passage to the Halig Tree? This is obviously more speculation, but based on what's given to us through context, we have an idea here as well. Thanks to our community, we actually pulled this video and wanted to make an important update. When Latena says the all-hearing brute, she is referring to Sir Gideon Ofnir. When telling Gideon about Mikola's egg, he says, If he continues his slumber within the cocoon, all will be well, but perhaps it would be safer to destroy it. Mikola is the one thing that remains a mystery to me. This, along with other dialogue from Gideon, shows that information about Melania and Mikola was something out of his reach, and for a man like Gideon, that was unacceptable. We believe it's possible that the Bloodhound Knight within this cave chose Gideon as his master, and was left behind to keep Latena where she is, cut off from anyone who had knowledge of the Halig Tree Medallion, since she herself did not have it. Thanks again to our community for catching this important note. The final bit of lore we learned regarding the Bloodhound Knights is also found within the Gelmir Hero's Grave. Found within a chest past the Bloodhound Knight is the spirit ash of Bloodhound Knight Fla. It reads, Spirit of a Bloodhound Knight they called the Rabid Stray, Fla vowed that there was only one lord he would ever serve, a true king. And so the Rabid Stray never found a master. Referring to Fla as a rabid stray further propels the narrative that these beastly knights truly live up to the loyal canines of their namesake. It's clear that the bloodhounds are rather cautious of choosing who they will serve. Lucky for our tarnished, Fla appears to believe that we are capable of fulfilling our destiny of becoming Elden Lord. While there isn't too much within the text of Elden Ring to give us a clear picture of the bloodhound knights, their intentions, and their place within this world, the context where we find them seems to be the biggest factor in unraveling their mystery, understanding their affinity towards whom they believe to be a fit master, as well as the intentions of said master, is ultimately how we formulated our findings. 
Whether these knights truly are fallen hounds from a shattered city, or simply lost warriors searching for a purpose, we can take solace in the fact that true, unfailing loyalty isn't a concept completely lost on the inhabitants of the lands between. Let us know in the comments if you have your own theories about the Bloodhound Knights. Like, subscribe, and hit the bell so you don't miss our next community chosen topic, the Tree Sentinels. We look forward to welcoming you back for more Elden Lore. The Knights of Zamor are an enigmatic set of enemies that we encounter in very specific areas of the Lands Between. We find the majority of the knights we can face in the Zamor ruins in the mountaintop of giants, while the ancient heroes of Zamor can be found within heroes' graves in the mountains and the Altus Plateau. So who are these knights? What is their purpose? And why are some of their people hailed as heroes and given extravagant burial grounds in the lands between? Let's find out. We can glean the most information about the knights of Zamor from the Zamor set. Each piece tells us they were hailed as heroes in the war against the giants, and that these long-lived heroes clad in biting, freezing winds are said to have been the mortal enemies of the fire giants since time immemorial. So we know that even though these knights have a ghastly, almost undead visage, they're likely not reanimated corpses, but simply a people with what those in the lands between consider to be an extended lifespan. They're clad in biting, freezing winds, which means the frost magic they wield can actually be felt just by standing in their presence. Most importantly, they were heroes in the war against the giants that Mariga and Radagon fought so long ago. They all seem to wield the Zamor Curved Sword, which tells us they earned great renown during the war against the giants. The weapon was made with an apparent devotion to winter, and is styled after an icy wind and imbued with a powerful frost effect. Not only do these knights utilize the power of frost, they've embedded it into their weaponry. Their fighting style is very loose and flowing, utilizing a speed almost akin to the Black Knife Assassins, and they take wide swings with their weapons, sometimes leaving behind ice that juts out to strike our tarnished. While they are a powerful, difficult enemy that prepares us for what to expect from the mountaintop of giants, it is possible their current strength pales in comparison to what they could do in their prime. When Queen Marika and Godfrey, the first Elden Lord, were on the warpath, conquering the lands between, they saw the fire giants as an obstacle too large for them to tackle with their strength alone. During this stage of the war, they enlisted the aid of the Knights of Zamor, who, as we know, were no friends of the fire giants. Marika herself considered their strength great enough to add to her own forces, and with the help of the Zamor, all but one of the fire giants were exterminated. For their help in taking the mountaintop of giants for the Golden Order, some of the Knights of Zamor were hailed as heroes. We can encounter the ancient heroes of Zamor in two different tombs in the lands between, and we believe that one of these graves is not meant for the ancient hero of Zamor himself. He instead defends this holy tomb and the riches within. This is the sainted hero's grave in the Altus Plateau, likely the second time we will encounter any warrior of Zamor if we've been thoroughly exploring the lands between. The ancient hero residing in this tomb protects the spirit ashes of the ancient dragon knight Kristoff. He is known as an honorable knight of Leyendel, who was also a devout worshipper of the ancient dragons. His skills strike down foes with thunderbolts, the dragon's weapon of choice. After the first defense of Leyendel, Kristoff earned the hero's honor of Erdtree burial for the feat of capturing Godfroy the Grafted. It is likely the title of Sainted Hero's Tomb is actually referring to Kristoff, and the Zamor hero defends him so that his ashes may remain undisturbed. The second tomb where we can encounter an ancient hero of Zamor is the giant conquering hero's grave. This grave seems to be dedicated to locking away secrets of the giants, as it is crawling with fire monks and even contains the giant seal. This item is described as a sacred seal depicting the one-eyed god of the fire giants, adorned with braids of red hair. Wielded by fire monks and prelates, this catalyst enhances giants' flame incantations. Once we reach the boss room of this tomb, we encounter an ancient hero of Zamor, and upon defeating him, 
we are rewarded with the Zamor Curve Sword and the Zamor Set. In this case, we think it's safe to assume that the giant conquering hero was the one we face in battle, as it would make sense for the tomb of a Zamor hero to rest above the Zamor ruins, and a member of this warrior tribe to want to lock away the secrets of their greatest enemies. The final ancient hero of Zamor we can find is easily the most mysterious. This hero is locked within an Everjail and is in fact the earliest possible Zamor warrior we can access. This Everjail is located in the Weeping Peninsula and requires a stone sword key. The big question here is why would a hero of Zamor be locked away when we know they were Marika's greatest allies during the war with the giants? We think that the reason for his imprisonment may have to do with the item he drops upon his defeat, Radagon's Scar Seal. This is a powerful talisman that represents the lifelong duty of those chosen by the gods, and it grants incredible power to its user at the cost of survivability. There are two possibilities we can see for why this hero is locked in the Weeping Everjail. First, he may have been given a mission to protect Radagon's Scar Seal from those who would take it for themselves. By sealing himself in an Everjail, and even adding the additional layer of security by requiring a Stone Sword Key, he would ensure the seal was protected, with one-to-one -one combat as his final stand. The second possibility is that after defeating the giants, this ancient hero took the Scar Seal for himself, and his punishment was locked within the Everjail. Of course, then we must ask, why was the Scar Seal left with him and not taken from his possession? The Knights of Zamor are a mysterious tribe of warriors, and while Elden Ring doesn't give too much detail on their culture, aside from their hatred of the fire giants, they leave a lasting impression with their tall, lanky build and frost magics. If you have any thoughts or theories surrounding the Knights of Zamor or their ancient heroes, leave a comment and we can discuss them as a community. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell so you never miss out on our dives into your favorite enemies. We look forward to seeing you again for more. Elden Lore. In the lands between, there are many warring factions fighting for land, power, and control. Each of these factions have knights in their employ that our Tarnish is forced to do battle with during our travels. We have already discussed the Crucible Knights, who they previously served possible motivations after their king's exile. Today we will be taking a look at another order of knights we can encounter in various areas of the lands between, the knight's cavalry. Who do they serve, and what is their place in this world? We hope to answer these questions. The knight's cavalry are clad in jet black armor, riding what is described as funeral steeds into battle, and can only be encountered at night. The first of these enemies you're likely to come across is found patrolling the bridge near Aguila Lake North. You'll likely run into them soon after learning how to convert runes into power, and they tend to catch many players off guard. These knights can also be fought in a number of other locations around the lands between, including the Weeping Peninsula, Lyurnia North, Lyurnia South, Caled, the Atlas Plateau, the Forbidden Lands, Dragonbarrow, and the Consecrated Snowfield. It's likely the Knight's Cavalry only ride at night as a way to get the drop on their enemies. By wearing black armor and riding black horses, they cloak themselves in the dark. It can be assumed they do this so that those they meet on the road don't realize they're being hunted until it's too late. They wield only two different kinds of weapons, the Knight Rider Glaive and the Knight Rider Flail. With each knight we defeat, our Tarnished earns armor, weapons, or ashes of war that pull back the curtain slightly on this enemy's greater purpose. The knight we meet near Agil Lake North wields the Knight Rider Glaive, which is described as a jet black glaive with a blade as weighty as a bludgeon. Weapon of the knight's cavalry who ride funeral steeds, this glaive excels at weighty slash attacks that crash into foes, making it a powerful weapon even on horseback. And upon defeat, they will drop the repeating thrust Ash of War. It's curious, as this ash doesn't seem like something this horseback riding knight would be likely to use. The knight's cavalry can drop ashes of war that seemingly have no relation to their fighting style or their order of knights. While they do not utilize any carrion magics, 
one can drop Ice Spear, a skill of the warriors who served Lunar Princess Rani that channels cold magic into a piercing spear of ice. Another of these knights drops the Ash of War Bloodhound Step. This skill allows the user to become temporarily invisible while dodging at high speed, moves faster and travels farther than a regular quick step. It's clearly associated with the Bloodhound Knights. The reason for these seemingly unrelated skills may be explained in yet another Ash of War. When we defeat the Knight's Cavalry in the Forbidden Lands, we attain Phantom Slash, a skill inspired by the fond remembrances of the Knight's Cavalry. It creates an apparition of the Knight's former instructor who guides a joint lunging upward swing. When we look at this skill alongside all of the other ashes that these knights can drop, it becomes apparent that the knights' cavalry assimilate the skills of those they defeat. The description of the knights' cavalry set adds some context as to how they have gained skills from across the lands between. The knights' cavalry, who now wander the dim roads at night, were once led by the fell omen, and were deliverers of death for great warriors, knights, and champions. The Knight's Cavalry specifically fought the greatest warriors they could find, and they were led by Margot, the Fell Omen. Or as we know him by the end of the game, Morgoth, the Omen King. From the armor description, it sounds as though the Knight's Cavalry no longer serve their master. However, upon defeating Margot, he says something curious. I shall remember thee, tarnished, smoldering with thy meager flame cower in fear of the night, the hands of the fell omen shall brook thee no quarter. What comes across as a cryptic threat at the beginning of the game changes with the understanding that the knight's cavalry serve Margit. He's telling us to cower in fear of his elite warriors who roam the lands between. They are his hands, and they will be hunting us down. When we reach the city of Lyndell and climb our way to the thrones of the Golden Order, Morgoth stands before us and explains how all of his brethren are willful traitors, and he refers to himself as the last of all kings. He also seems to think that being the king of the lands between is a stain on the thrones of his siblings. While Morgoth may think he is not fit to lead, the knight's cavalry do not question him. Their loyalty lies with the fell omen. They patrol the lands between, likely hunting tarnished in an attempt to keep us away from great runes, the Ur Tree, and their king. While we wish there were more we could learn about the knights from information in-game, we believe we've put together as comprehensive a picture as possible with what we have available. If you'd like to see more of these smaller lore dives, or if you'd prefer we tackle multiple smaller topics in a single video, please comment and let us know. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell so you don't miss out on the next dive into Elden Lore. The world of Elden Ring is teeming with monsters and enemies ready to destroy our tarnished at every turn. We learn this very quickly during our first encounter with the grafted Scion, the introductory boss meant to show us how punishing death can be. Of course, after losing this fight, we find ourselves in the tutorial area of the game, where we're taught the basics of survival. After emerging from that cave, we are met with another seemingly insurmountable challenge. A large, golden-clad knight riding an armored steed, holding a halberd and shield larger than our tarnished. We quickly learn that battle may not be our best option, and oftentimes we're forced to run from this formidable foe. We encounter tree sentinels in a few different areas of the lands between, but who are they? Why do they seem to be patrolling areas our tarnished absolutely needs to pass through in order to reach the Ur Tree? And from where do they draw their incredible strength? Let's dive in. Before we go any further, we wanted to make a quick shout out to Pat G, who has been creating the incredible artwork for our video thumbnails. Make sure to check out his store linked in the description if you'd like to bring home any of these prints for yourself, or as a gift for the Elden Ring fan in your life. The first place we need to look for information on the Tree Sentinels is their armor set. Every piece of this set is described as the armor of the heavy cavalry Tree Sentinels who serve the Erd Tree. Imposingly sturdy and nigh unbreakable, the grace of old yet lingers. 
The chest piece of the armor is also adorned with a cape featuring the mark of the sacred tree. These armor pieces imply that the tree sentinels may not serve a specific ruler such as Marika or Godric, but the Ur tree itself. The Ur tree great shield also tells us the tree sentinels are the living rampart of the Ur tree. The tree sentinels are the standard by which all defenders of the Ur tree aspire. So any knight who serves the Ur tree look at becoming a sentinel as their ultimate goal. This information applies to all tree sentinels, but we learn after making our way to Leyndel that there is another variation of this knight, the Draconic Tree Sentinel. One of these enemies can drop the malformed dragon set, which explains how these sentinels came to wield the power of dragons. Each piece of armor is described as malformed and is adorned with various dragon imagery and worn by the misshapen tree sentinels. After the great ancient dragon Grand Sax attacked, the sentinels had an epiphany. The only way to truly protect the Ur tree was to become dragons themselves. When Grand Sax attacked the royal capital, he brought down the walls of Leyndel. This was the first time in recorded history these walls had ever been breached, and this started the war against the dragons. Various items throughout Elden Ring unravel the story of the war with the dragons, but in order to stay focused on the draconic tree sentinels, we won't dig into this. Yet. The Draconic Tree Sentinels wield incredible power, and the reason for this is because they have most likely engaged in Dragon Communion. Their malformed armor bears dragon ornamentation and reinforces the connection between their power and that of dragons. These Sentinels were already the strongest defenders of the Ur Tree, and in order to defend it from any and all threats, they took the power of the dragons for themselves. We can see the outcome of their communion with the magics these Sentinels wield, but they also became dragons in a less literal sense, by taking trophies from those they slayed for their communion and fashioning them into equipment. The dragon Great Claw is said to have been whittled from the claw of a great ancient dragon, wielded by grotesque tree sentinels who yet serve the Ur tree. The claw is enwreathed with lightning and tears through the dragon's feeble descendants with ease. Again, we see how these sentinels fashion themselves into a force capable of slaying dragons to protect the Ur tree. However, the item description also says they yet serve the Ur tree, implying that eventually their dabbling in dragon communion could someday pull them away from their purpose. Now that we know who the tree sentinels are and where they draw their power from, the question remains why do we continually find them obstructing our path to the Ur tree? Unlike other boss enemies in Elden Ring, we only find the sentinels in areas meant to halt our progression to our main goal. We believe this is intentional not from a game design standpoint, but from a lore perspective. The first tree sentinel we discover is immediately after we emerge into Limgrave. We can assume that most, if not all tarnished, start in this same area, as Var waits here to see what new tarnished he may be able to recruit to his cause. This means that the Tree Sentinel is likely to do battle with all of these new Tarnished as well. The Sentinels have dedicated themselves to the Ur Tree. They are its rampart, and their goal is to destroy all who threaten it. After defeating Morgoth, we learn that in order to become Elden Lord, we must burn the Ur Tree, and we believe it's likely that the Tree Sentinels, being the Ur Tree's closest defenders, know this as well. This is why one of their order is stationed immediately outside of the area where Tarnished emerge into the lands between, to destroy them, shake their resolve, and dissuade them from following Grace. Again, we find two tree sentinels on the road to Leyndel. They stand in front of a large doorway that leads to the road that will take us into the city. They attack as a team, trying to prevent us from making our way to the foot of the Ur tree, and are a formidable force to battle at the same time. Should we keep following this road, we reach the entrance to the city, this time defended by a draconic tree sentinel, the strongest of their order we have faced up to this point. Only by defeating him do we make our way into the city. The next idea is only a theory, but we know thanks to the Magma Breath incantation that Dragon Communion can turn a person into a Magma Wyrm if abused. Those who have performed the Dragon Communion will find their humanity slowly slipping away, once they fully succumb to their fate, they are left no more than Wyrams that crawl the earth. 
If we climb the scaffolding from Raya Lucaria to Landell, we face Magma Wirum Makar. Makar will drop the Magma Wirum Scale Sword if defeated, which tells us, It's said these land-bound dragons were once human heroes who partook in Dragon Communion, a grave transgression for which they were cursed to crawl the earth upon their bellies, shadows of their former selves. It would make sense that a draconic tree sentinel would have been protecting a secret passage to the Altus Plateau, and the Magma Wyrm Scale Sword is another blade made from the remains of a dragon, just like the Dragon Great Claw. There's no solid evidence that Makar used to be a draconic tree sentinel, but the lore around these monsters does make it seem plausible. There is one more draconic tree sentinel we can face in crumbling Farah Missoula. They guard the entrance to Malakath's boss room, and again, display an impressive strength that is not easily defeated, even by the most formidable tarnished. The fact that there is a sentinel guarding this area reinforces the idea that these knights know that the greatest threat to the Erdtree is a tarnished chasing the title of Elden Lord. As we attempt to burn the Erdtree, we are teleported to crumbling Farah Missoula, and from here, the only way to escape is by defeating Malakath, the Black Blade, and unbinding Destined Death. Enya tells us when asked about burning the Ur tree that, for the flame to burn the Ur tree, a sacrifice is needed of one who envisions the flame and can lead you to the rune of death. And the finger maiden crone at the Grand Lift of Roll tells us, the burning of the Ur tree is the first cardinal sin. Doing so will unbind destined death and slay the world itself. Both of these dialogues imply it is not enough to kindle the tree. The flame will not take hold until we unbind destined death, and we can only do that by getting past this final draconic tree sentinel and facing Malekith. The tree sentinel's purpose, first and foremost, is to defend the Ur tree. These knights understand that the greatest threat to the tree is us, the tarnished, those who wish to rip the title of Elden Lord away from Radagon, and can only do so by destroying the Ur tree. They try to stop us at every milestone along the way but if we are persistent, we can overcome them and surpass their power. We hope you learned something new about the Tree Sentinels from this dive into their lore. Feel free to comment with any other theories you may have about this Order of Knights. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell so you don't miss our next video on the Black Knife Assassins. We look forward to seeing you again for more Elden Lore. The dragons of the lands between are powerful creatures, prepared to burn our tarnish to cinders should we even look in their direction. It is said the undead denizens of Limgrave would gaze at the skies over the lakes, praying that the dragon's flames would burn them to ash. This would be a kindness to those without the ability to die of natural causes due to the removal of the rune of death. While these people saw the dragons as their salvation from a life unending, Others saw the power of the dragons and coveted it for themselves. These knights made sport of hunting dragons across the land, wearing the wings and skins of their felled marks with pride across their armor. The Drake Knights may have once been a strong faction in this world, but by the time we make our way to the lands between, none truly remain, as the only one we can meet has strayed from her path. That said, if we follow the clues, we can unravel the ultimate fate of this faction of knights. The Drake Knights may just be the oldest knight faction in the Lands Between, as their armor set is found within a chest in Crumbling Far Missoula. If you subscribe to the theory that Far Missoula exists outside of time, tied somehow to the past, then that would mean that this armor set has existed since at least the defeat of Dragonlord Placidusax. Regardless of that theory, this land has clearly been locked away long enough that if the Drake Knight armor is being kept here, it's safe to say it's extremely old. Interestingly, this set does not give any information on how old the faction may be. It only explains their purpose. The helm tells us it is the Black Iron Helm worn by Drake Knights, features the spoils of a dragon catch as an emblem of pride as both dragon hunter and partaker of communion. From birth, Drake Knights speak not a word. They spend their lives pursuing the strength of dragons, 
for its sublime beauty and inspiration of awe. The armor also includes a cape which is crafted with dragon wing membrane. Why the Drake Knights never speak is a mystery, but in its simplest explanation, these warriors are dedicated to taking the strength of the dragons for themselves. In order to understand the Drake Knights, we have to understand Dragon Communion. We can learn about this process through multiple items and descriptions in the game, and even from Yora, the Bloody Finger Hunter. The Dragon Communion Seal is a formless Drake Blood Seal with a Dragon Communion Crest, and it tells us, The sacrificial devouring of the heart gives power. Indeed, Dragon Communion is too primal in nature for the term incantation to be appropriate. This seal scales incantations with one's arcane attribute. Various dragon incantations also outline the sheer strength of the dragons, saying they are incantations of those who have hunted dragons and feasted upon their hearts. This is a pure and overwhelming power. Other incantations tell us those extraordinary individuals who perpetuate dragon communion are called the Dragonhearted. This gives us another moniker for the Drake Knights the Dragon Hearted. So we know the Drake Knights are dedicated to hunting dragons, and they partake in Dragon Communion to enhance their strength. But what exactly is Dragon Communion? After defeating Flying Dragon Aguil at Aguil Lake, we can speak with Yura, who says to us, Beautiful work, felling that dragon, and as such, there's something you might like to know. The heart you brought back. It's used in Dragon Communion. If you should find yourself overcome by hunger for the heart, yearning for its strength, then seek the decrepit church on the little island off the western coast. You must not forget, though, those who partake in Dragon Communion will one day shed their humanity, their hunger for dragon, their yearning only worsens until the floodgates burst, unleashing eternal torment, the strength of a mighty dragon. Magnificent, but deadly. It's no surprise that dragon communion is ruinous. This explanation shines a light on the process and cost of dragon communion. Dragon hearts are consumed at the altars of dragon communion, and the person engaging in this ritual is granted the strength of dragons through incantations. However, there is a danger to overindulging in this practice, as the Magma Breath incantation tells us. One of the incantations of Dragon Communion transforms Caster into a worm to spew Magma Breath, allows one follow-up attack. Those who have performed the Dragon Communion will find their humanity slowly slipping away. Once they fully succumb to their fate, they are left no more than worms that crawl the earth. From this explanation, it seems as though those that overindulge in communion become a form of dragon themselves. Upon defeating Magma Worm Makar, we earn the Magma Worm Scale Sword. This weapon is a curved greatsword wielded by Magma Worms. The shape resembles a dragon's jaw and is covered in hard scales. It's said these landbound dragons were once human heroes who partook in Dragon Communion, a grave transgression for which they were cursed to crawl the earth upon their bellies, shadows of their former selves. This item description confirms the idea that if you partake in Dragon Communion too often, your ultimate fate will be to become a Magma Worm. This means there's a strong possibility that the worms we face throughout the lands between were once Drake Knights themselves. There is also the possibility that some of them were once draconic tree sentinels as we outlined in a previous lore video, as any who overindulge in this practice may become worms, but it seems there's more evidence that these enemies were once drake knights. There is only one drake knight who escaped this fate, Eleonora, the Violet Bloody Finger. While we already have a video discussing her backstory and relationship with Yura, the Bloody Finger Hunter, there is an aspect of her character we didn't cover. It seems as though the draw of the Bloody Finger, of Moog's power, is actually stronger than the lust for power that accompanies Dragon Communion. It can be assumed that Eleonora once felt that same pull from engaging in Communion, and was always looking for her next mark, 
the next heart to consume to gain more power. What if Eleonora knew her fate as a Drake Knight? She knew one day that she would become a worm, cursed to wander the land on her belly. But she continued to travel with Yura anyway, until one day she was approached by an acolyte of Moog, the Lord of Blood. What if an offer was made? Serve Moog, become a bloody finger, and replace your hunger for dragon hearts with a lust for blood. What if Eleonora saw a way out, a way to retain her human form, but to take it, she needed to give up her most precious connection, her relationship with Yura. This could be how Eleonora resisted the urge for dragon communion and kept her human form, never being consigned to become a magma worm, maintaining her humanity, but losing something precious along the way. It seems the ultimate fate of the Drake Knights was to travel the world killing so many dragons and consuming so many hearts that they eventually became dragons themselves, cursed to roam the land without the ability to take flight. They gained the power they were always fighting and scraping for, but at the cost of their human forms. Never again would they be human, but they wouldn't be dragons either, simply worms, without the ability to fly, their wings decrepit not fully formed, unable to carry their weight. In the end, the Drake Knights are lost to history due to their lust for power, and the final member of their order is nothing more than a bloodthirsty warrior, consigned to working alongside Moog in order to avoid the fate of her comrades. Thank you for joining us for our dissection of the Drake Knights, the most enigmatic knights in the lands between. Do you believe the magma worms we faced throughout the game were once Drake Knights? Did Eleonora break the draw of Dragon Communion by becoming a Bloody Finger? Has this power always been a part of the Lands Between, or were the Altars of Dragon Communion brought here from another land? Why does the Drake Knight armor set go so hard? We look forward to reading your thoughts and theories in the comments. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell so you never miss out on any of our lore dives. We can't wait to see you again for more Elden Lore. One of the most popular enemies in Elden Ring is easily the Crucible Knight. These knights receive significant publicity before the release of the game, with plenty of images and concept art that shows you what kind of imposing figures you'd be coming across in the lands between. However, even with all of their popularity, little is known about the Crucible Knights, and what can be gleaned from the game is hidden entirely in descriptions from their armor and incantations. So why are the Crucible Knights treated with so much grandeur? Why are they found throughout the world of Elden Ring, in various locations, and not confined to fighting under one lord, like so many other enemy types? And what was their purpose before the Shattering? Players can encounter a Crucible Knight fairly early in their journey at the Stormhill Everjail. At early levels, this enemy can absolutely destroy your Tarnished with large, heavy sword swings, shield bashes, and a variety of powerful incantations. Defeating this foe will have it drop the incantation, Aspects of the Crucible, Tail, which gives us our first look into where these knights draw their power. The description of this incantation tells us it is one of the ancient Erdtree incantations, and it is a manifestation of the Erdtree's primal vital energies, an aspect of the primordial crucible where all life once blended together. From this we can glean that the Crucible Knight is named for the Primordial Crucible, which is seen as where life began in the Lands Between, within the Earth Tree. By defeating another Crucible Knight hidden in the Stormvale Castle Legacy Dungeon, we can find another of these incantations. Aspects of the Crucible, Horns, creates a mighty horn on the caster's shoulder to gore foes from a low stance. And yet another Crucible Knight will drop Aspects of the Crucible Breath, which creates a throat pouch on the caster's neck, allowing them to spew fiery breath while walking. 
It's important to note that all three of these incantations, and the Crucible Knight's ability to sprout wings, seem to tie back to both where life started in the Ur Tree and dragons. With the knowledge that Dragon Lord Placidu was Elden Lord in the time before the Ur Tree, it is possible this power is tied to the original Elden Lord. The most information we can learn about who the Crucible Knights are comes from Crucible Knight Ordovis, who can be found in the Oriza Hero's Grave. By defeating this knight, we are given a plethora of information through the Crucible Axe set. The first important piece of this puzzle comes from the description text, Armor of one of the sixteen ancient knights who served Godfrey, the first Elden Lord. This is huge as it tells us exactly who these knights served, and how many of them existed through the lands between. The helm of this set tells us, the axe ornamentation is the knight Ordovis's mark, displayed also by his men. It makes sense that Ordovis would choose an axe as the symbol for these knights, as Godfrey's signature weapon during this time was his massive axe. For both the greaves and gauntlets of this set, we also learn that the strength shown by these knights and even their appearance was seen as chaotic and deserving of scorn. From the previous description text, we can learn a couple of things. Firstly, the Crucible Knights seem to have remained in the lands between after Godfrey was exiled. This explains why we see Crucible Knights in various places around the lands, in service of others, or locked away in an Everjail. Second, likely due to their service of Godfrey and control over the Erdtree's power, the people of the lands between may have seen them as heretical. Without a lord to serve, these knights turned to using their powers in whatever way they saw fit, and given that we can encounter 14 Crucible Knights throughout the game, it's entirely possible that we will see the last two in future DLC. That is unless, these last two knights are already out there somewhere, and we've yet to find them. Now that we know who the Crucible Knights are, let's take a look at where they've ended up after being in service of Godfrey. Our first knight is the one you're most likely to encounter early in the game, trapped within an Everjail. Given that these Everjails effectively function as prisons, it is likely that this knight never gave up his allegiance to his lord, leading to his being locked away. This likely served as an example to other knights not to overstep or question Godfrey's exile. The second knight we can find resides just outside of Stormvale Castle. He walks back and forth outside the castle walls in an area that can only be reached by dropping down the side of the castle after leaving the Rampart Tower site of Grace. This knight seems to have found himself in the service of Godric the Grafted. This would make sense, as a knight of Godfrey may feel some sense of duty to protecting a relation of the first Elden Lord's son, even though he resides on the lowest rung of the Golden Lineage. Another Crucible Knight can be fought alongside a misbegotten warrior in the area just outside of the Star Scourge Radon boss fight. This knight residing in Kaelid likely cares only for battle. This area of Kaelid draws strong warriors to compete, so they may have found their purpose in fighting alongside the misbegotten warrior. A Crucible Knight and a Tree Knight can be found while exploring the aqueducts. The difference between them being that the Tree Knight wields a lance. It's unknown exactly what these knights are doing here, but it's possible they may be patrolling the aqueduct to deter any who might want to challenge the valiant gargoyle. Alternatively, Dee's brother Devon is beyond these knights. Perhaps they have a reason to be guarding him, as his brother fights back against the undead and the restoration of death to the lands between. One more crucible knight can be found when traveling to Nokrin, the Forbidden City, through use of the four belfries. This knight stands at the edge of a destroyed bridge, looking out into the void. As there's no way to leave this place without the ability to travel through grace, he likely became trapped here at some point, and waits for a worthy challenger to end his imprisonment. Both Fia and the giant warrior jar can summon enemies donning the armor of the Crucible Knights. It's important to note that these knights do not have access to the full range of Crucible Knight abilities, and seem to be player characters donning their armor. The difference between these summon knights is that Fias look like a summon spirit, while the warrior jar takes the form of an invader. If these two are actually crucible knights, it's very possible Fia is summoning the remains of one who has fallen in battle. 
Either way, these may be two more examples of Crucible Knights finding new masters to follow after the loss of Godfrey. The most interesting Crucible Knight, in my opinion, would be the one we encounter in Volcano Manor. Known as Tanith's Knight, this warrior seems to have thrown off his title as a Crucible Knight and now works in service of the Matriarch of the Manor. It seems his path led him to turn his back on the Golden Order after Godfrey's exile, and he found his purpose as part of the group hunting Tarnished. Given his devotion to Tanith, attacking us should we kill her, it is possible he even knew the truth of Volcano Manor and wanted to see Rikard destroy the other demigods as revenge for his exiled lord. Two tree knights can be found while exploring Lanedell. It's possible these knights never left their post after Godfrey's exile, choosing to remain in service to his wife, Queen Merica, and defending the royal capital. We encounter a named Crucible Knight in the Deep Root Depths, called Crucible Knight Saluria. She stands at the foot of an old tree, broken and blackened, defending the chest inside, which contains a set of Tree Knight armor, meant for those she deems worthy to be among her Crucible Knights. She is described as one of the two honored as foremost among the Crucible Knights, and likely had her own knights under her command. It's unknown why she now resides in the Deep Root Depths, but the tree she stands in front of does have small trees growing around and inside of it with bright yellow leaves, which may mean this is the remains of an old earth tree that was possibly burned down or destroyed. Lastly, we have two Crucible Knights fighting together in the Oriza Hero's Grave, one unnamed and the other Leader of the Knights, or Dovis. While we do not know who resides within the Oriza Hero's Grave, we know they are important enough for Ordovis to believe their remains are worth protecting. The description of Ordovis' great sword reads, Great Sword of Ordovis, one of the two honored as foremost among the Crucible Knights. This sword is imbued with an ancient holy essence. Its red tint exemplifies the nature of primordial gold, said to be close in nature to life itself. This further solidifies that Ordovis was the strongest among this group. The Crucible Knights are an imposing force in the Lands Between, and I know any time I came across them in-game, I would immediately check how many runes I was holding, and wonder if I should use a sacrificial twig. We hope you learned something new during this deep dive into these fascinating enemies. I think it would be a missed opportunity for Elden Ring not to utilize them further with any possible future DLC, but what do you think? Like, subscribe, and leave a comment telling us your favorite enemy type from Elden Ring and maybe we can look into their lore for you in the next Elden Lore. When we started writing Elden Ring lore videos, it was to share the experience of digging through this game with the help of the community. Our first big exploration was the Crucible Knights, and thanks to that video, our channel received a significant signal boost from YouTube, and because of that, we reached so many new viewers and received so many comments that the video itself now feels deeply incomplete. With that in mind, we wanted to do something special for our 50th episode of Elden Lore by going back to the Crucible Knights and incorporating all of the findings made through our community, presenting a more comprehensive picture of these enemies and their place in the Lands Between. We're going to call out various commenters through the video that helped to flesh out this picture, but given the vast amount of comments that video received, we obviously can't mention everyone. With that said, if you've ever watched or commented on that original video, thank you. Square Table Gaming would not be where it is now without that initial boost, and you are the reason we do what we do. Now let's explore the Crucible Knights again, with a stronger understanding of their place within the lore of Elden Ring. In order to gain a basic understanding of the Crucible Knights, we can look toward the various armors, weapons, and incantations associated with them. The Crucible Axe armor is described as the armor of the Crucible Knights who served Godfrey, the first Elden Lord, worn by the Knight Ordovis and his men, or Saluria, depending on whose armor you're looking at. Holds the power of the Crucible of Life, the primordial form of the Ur-Tree, strengthens aspects of the Crucible incantations, while this is a fairly succinct explanation of who the knights were, 
There's a missing detail from Elden Ring's beta telling us that there were only ever 16 Crucible Knights in the world. This shows what an elite force they were in the Lands Between. While their armor tells us who they were, their gauntlets provide a little history. In time, the strength shown by these knights, and even their appearance, was seen as chaotic and deserving of scorn. So while they were likely praised in their early days, fighting alongside the first Elden Lord himself, over time they were made outcasts, likely because of their connection to the Primordial Crucible. We need only look to the Crucible Knot Talisman to explain why this connection would cause them such trouble. A talisman fashioned from a bony knot that embodies aspects of various creatures, said to have grown on the human body long ago, a vestige of the Crucible of Primordial Life. Born partially of devolution, it was considered a signifier of the divine in ancient times, but it is now increasingly disdained as an impurity as civilization has advanced. All three of the aspects of the Crucible incantations we can find provide the same piece of lore. This is a manifestation of the Earth Tree's primal vital energies, an aspect of the Primordial Crucible, where all life was once blended together. Knowing these are the powers wielded by the Crucible Knights, it's made clear that their name is literal. They are connected to this ancient power, much the same way omens are. Omens are considered touched by the Crucible, and for that they are shunned by society, having their horns removed at birth which kills most of them. Those that survive are hidden underground or used as muscle, and are hunted by the Omen Hunters. Even the children of America born Omen, Morgoth and Moog, were locked away beneath the city until they each took up arms for their own missions. To put it simply, anything associated with the Primordial Crucible is now despised in the Lands Between, which is why we find the Crucible Knights scattered across the lands, fighting under different banners, no longer an elite force, but disgraced warriors taking up arms for their own reasons. As we mentioned, there were 16 Crucible Knights in their order before Godfrey was banished from the Lands Between and his forces were dissolved. In our original video on the Crucible Knights, we had discovered 14 of these warriors in-game, but through the help of the community, we not only identified two knights we had listed that were nothing more than ghosts of player characters, but found the missing four knights throughout the Lands Between. Moving forward, we're going to take a look at all 16 Crucible Knights, where they were found in the world, and what their location may say about their story after their order was disbanded. The first Crucible Knight most of us encountered while playing Elden Ring was actually found within an ever jail. Notice how I'm putting emphasis on jail as many in the community left comments calling us out on our mispronunciation of Everjail as Evergal. We've learned our lesson, we promise. Anyway, the Crucible Knight locked in this Everjail is likely our first encounter with these enemies, and can be devastatingly difficult for new players. Like many of the knights we find, there's no real context given for why they are located here, trapped forever in their jail. But we theorize that this particular knight may have fought back against the banishment of Lord Godfrey. What better way to disband the Crucible Knights and break their spirits than to magically lock away any member of their order who questioned their treatment of the first Elden Lord? There is a Crucible Knight found on the Rampart Tower cliff in Stormvale Castle, and his presence here can seem a bit jarring. However, the context around Godric the Grafted could provide some clues as to his allegiance. As we know, Godric surrounded himself with the strongest forces he could find. The actual soldiers of Godric only defend the land around his castle, but once inside, we face exiled knights, banished knights, grafted forces, omen, eagles, lions, and even a troll. It would make sense that Godric would seek out a crucible knight to add to his ranks. This knight, however, seems to protect an area of the castle one would rarely find themselves in. It's possible that this knight felt some sense of duty to work under Godric, given his likely lineage to Godwin, son of Godfrey, but that sense of duty would only take him so far. Choosing to defend an area of the castle far from his liege, who he likely saw for what he was, a far cry from worthy of his place amongst the demigods. When visiting the four belfries, we can enter a portal that takes us to Nokrin, 
where we see a crucible knight staring off into the sky of this underground land. We originally thought that this knight simply stood on this destroyed bridge because he was trapped. Without grace to allow free movement around the land, there was no way for them to leave this spot. However, as commenter Adele Grief pointed out, they aren't just staring into the void. This knight is looking at Moog's castle. Perhaps he keeps watch over Moog, the son of his lord Godfrey, but chooses to do it from afar so as to keep themselves separated from his worship of the formless mother. Or perhaps it's the opposite. Maybe this knight seeks to find a way to Moog's palace to end the heresy of his former liege's offspring. Two crucible knights can be found in another area of Nokren. When traveling to the waterfall basin, we encounter a knight wielding a spear and another wielding a sword. These knights seem to be defending the area ahead, and we think we know why. Just past them, we can find D, Beholder of the Dead, a man whose brother is dedicated to ending those who live in death. While he himself takes up that cause upon his brother's death, perhaps these knights were acting as wardens to keep D from heading deeper into the basin. Why would they be doing this? Because if you follow the basin, you can make your way to the resting place of Godwin the Golden's remains. Godwin was the golden son, the only one of Godfrey's children not to be born an omen, and we believe it well within the realm of possibility that these knights may have taken up the task of defending him. While they couldn't save him in life, they could at least defend his corpse from being disturbed after his death. Interestingly, another knight can be found in the Deep Root Depths, and we'll be discussing her next. As we make our way through the depths, we can find an old tree, possibly the remains of a minor earth tree from long ago, and standing guard over it is Crucible Knight Saluria. She is the only named Crucible Knight wearing the Crucible Tree armor, and upon her defeat, she drops the great spear, Saluria's tree. The description of this weapon tells us it is the weapon of one of the two honored as foremost among the Crucible Knights. The primordial form of the Ur tree is close in nature to life itself, and this spear, modeled on its crucible, is imbued with its ancient holy essence. Given that she is known as one of the two honored as foremost in their order, we believe it's likely Saluria led the Crucible Tree Knights, while another led the Crucible Axe Knights. As for her purpose here, we believe she, like the two knights defending the basin, was a last line of defense against those who would desecrate the corpse of Godwin the Golden. It is also worth noting that just beyond Saluria, within the husk of the tree she was stationed in front of, we can find the Crucible Tree Knight armor set. Perhaps this armor belonged to another of their order, one who has already died by the time we enter the Lands Between, but who we can still face in battle. If we make our way through the Road's End Catacombs, we face a spirit caller snail. These snails are able to call on spirits from beyond the grave to fight on their behalf. As long as we don't kill it too quickly, it can summon both a Crucible Axe Knight and a Crucible Tree Knight. Even if we never encounter any Crucible Knights before this point, it can still summon these enemies. This tells us that at least two Crucible Knights have died before we made our way to the Lands Between accounting for two more of the overall 16. This also helps us account for the Tree Knight armor found behind Saluria, thanks to the Nexus for calling this detail out in the comments of our original video. Another Crucible Knight can be fought alongside a misbegotten warrior near the Red Main Castle Festival Ground. We believe this knight cares only for battle, which would explain why he made his way to Kaelid after Godfrey's exile. This area of Kaelid draws strong warriors to compete so they likely found their purpose in fighting alongside the misbegotten warrior against any who would challenge them. While others in the Lands Between would refuse to fight alongside this beast, a Crucible Knight would see no issue with having a misbegotten as a battle companion. They both draw their strength from the Primordial Crucible, and they both thirst for victory. In Landell, we are able to face two different Crucible Knights while exploring the city. We believe these knights may have chosen to swear their fidelity to Marika after their lord was banished, which would explain their presence in the royal capital. One of these knights is found standing over a long dead corpse, which has a hero's rune lying on top of it. Notably, 
they also appear to be staring at an ornate depiction of the Ur tree. Another is found patrolling the area around Grant Sack's bolt. These knights are both found without many other soldiers around them, perhaps being left to their own devices, as others in Marika's forces disdain their primordial power. Another two Crucible Knights can be found in Crumbling Far Missoula. Neither of these were mentioned in our original video, so thank you to Core54 and Angel Down for being the first two commenters to call them out to us. One of these knights can be found alongside the corpse of a dragon, while the other can be found fighting against beastmen. We believe the origins of these knights can be traced back to Godfrey's battle with Dragonlord Placidusax. At some point in the past, we know this battle took place, with Godfrey defeating the Dragonlord and leaving him gravely injured. So it would make sense that he would have taken his elite knights into battle with him during his march on Faramazula. What if two of his knights were left behind to ensure no one disturbed this place after their victory? This would explain why one of them is found embroiled in battle, while another stands over the remains of a slain dragon, an enemy he likely defeated with his comrades years ago. It's possible these knights have no idea their lord was banished, they're simply continuing to follow their orders to this day. After making our way through the Oriza Hero's Grave, we can come face to face with another named Crucible Knight, Ordovis. He fights alongside another knight, and upon defeating them both, we receive the Crucible Axe Set and Ordovis' Greatsword. This sword is identical to those carried by all of the sword-wielding Crucible Knights, and its item description sheds light on Ordovis' place in their order. Great Sword of Ordovis, one of the two honored as foremost among the Crucible Knights. This sword is imbued with an ancient holy essence. Its red tint exemplifies the nature of primordial gold, said to be close in nature to life itself. Knowing that the axe armor is said to be worn by Ordovis's men, and the tree armor is said to be worn by Siluria's men, we know that these two were likely the commanders of the Crucible Knights under Godfrey. Ordovis' greatsword also talks about the red tint of primordial gold, which is not mentioned anywhere else in Elden Ring. By saying it's close in nature to life itself, perhaps it's implying that the brilliant gold of the Ur tree may be an abnormality, removed from how life should be in the lands between. When it comes to why Ordovis chose to remain in the Oriza's hero grave, we can't say definitively. But if we had to guess, we'd say he was likely placed there by Godfrey, and given the aid of a Crucible Tree Knight by Siluria. The last Crucible Knight we have to discuss is my personal favorite. When we reach the Volcano Manor, we can speak with Lady Tanith, and behind her stands a Crucible Axe Knight that has clearly sworn his allegiance to the manor. Known as Tanith's Knight, this warrior seems to have thrown off his title as a Crucible Knight, and now works in service of the Matriarch of Volcano Manor. It seems his path led him to turn his back on the Golden Order entirely after Godfrey's exile, and he found his purpose as part of Reichardt's inner circle. We believe this knight is the only one of their order who chose to fight back against those who deemed them nothing more than creatures to be disdained due to their very nature. We believe he was appointed by Reichardt to defend Tanith, which explains why the only way for us to meet him in battle is to kill Tanith while she feasts on Reichardt's remains. Ultimately, we believe he wanted to see Rikard destroy the other demigods as revenge for his exiled lord. As an aside, another fun bit of lore that we believe is now common knowledge was first brought to our attention by Lieutenant Cedar Xander. Both Ordovis and Siluria are named after real-life time periods, the Ordovisian and the Silurian, both of which took place hundreds of millions of years ago. It's a fun tie-in to the idea that the Primordial Crucible existed long before the time of the Ur-Tree, and speaks to just how ancient the power wielded by these knights truly is. There we have it, a definitive list outlining all 16 Crucible Knights that can be found throughout Elden Ring. While some claim that the description calling out the 16 Knights should no longer be considered canon due to its removal from the armor set after the closed beta, we believe it's no coincidence that we can account for each of these knights in-game. 
Of course, we could always find new Crucible Knights in future DLCs that would lend credence to the idea that we should ignore that number. Unless, of course, we're dealing with a world within a dream, which I still think is a real possibility. So what did you think of this revamped exploration of the Crucible Knights? Let us know in the comments how you feel about our dissection of each knight. Like and subscribe so you never miss another lore dive. Thank you so much for joining us for our 50th episode in this series. We sincerely appreciate every single one of you. We'll see you next time for more Elden Lore.